historian at the National Portrait Gallery. Next, a look at Washington, D.C.'s financial situation. D.C. Mayor Marion Barry, officials with the General Accounting Office and other officials testify before a joint hearing of two House subcommittees with oversight over the district's finances. The uh, meeting will come to order. This is a joint hearing of the subcommittee of the District of Columbia of the Government Reform and Oversight Committee and the subcommittee of the District of Columbia on, of the Appropriations Committee. The hearing will now come to order. The format of a joint hearing, uh, even of two small subcommittees, is a bit awkward. Uh, as the host of this hearing, I will preside for the members of my subcommittee and I will yield to Mr. Walsh uh, to recognize the members of his subcommittee. This procedure might seem convoluted, but we've agreed to it and we'll proceed in the following fashion. I'll say I have an announcement to make and if someone's present, I will then yield to Mr. Walsh to recognize members of his committee. For example, if Mr. Livingston is present, it will say I will yield to Mr. Walsh to recognize Chairman Livingston. After Mr. Livingston makes any remarks, I would reclaim the chair and make my oral statement and then go back and forth. Then I'll yield to Mr. Walsh for any statement uh, he wishes to make. Then Mrs. Norton will be recognized by me and Mr. Dixon will be recognized by Mr. Walsh. If other members uh, wish to make opening statements, they will be recognized. If most everyone wants to say something, then I suggest we proceed as usual, going from majority to minority. I will switch the order and recognize appropriations subcommittee members and then authorization subcommittee members. Because this hearing may be quite lengthy, I intend to hold my oral statement to five minutes. I have a longer statement for the record that will be available to any of you. I request that um, other members limit their opening remarks as well in order that we may get to the important business at hand. We can each speak directly to the press after the hearing if that is any member's desire. Mr. John Hill will testify for GAO. Uh, he will have as much time as he needs to discuss the matters that we have asked the GAO to look into. We'll then take as much time as needed to question Mr. Hill. I will insist on the five-minute rule, however, for members. If any, anyone has more questions to ask Mr. Hill, uh, then we can have multiple rounds, but it would be unfair to let one or two members dominate the time while others are waiting. The mayor and council chair will make their oral presentations, and they will be accompanied by the acting chief financial officer, uh, who will not make a presentation. I have no intention of holding the mayor and the council chair to five minutes of their oral presentation. I hope that they have some important things to tell us. I do hope that we uh, do not get into a speech-making mode, however, because this hearing is essentially a fact-finding and is not the right time uh, to make uh, speeches. At this point, I would like to introduce some of the members uh, present uh, on the uh, authorization side. I'd like to introduce my, uh, first of all, the chairman of the full committee, Honorable William Klinger from Pennsylvania. And Mr. Klinger, thank you very much for being here. Uh, Mrs. Norton is the uh, ranking minority member of the committee. Mr. McHugh from New York is a member of the authorizing uh, committee. And Mr. La Tourette uh, from the uh, authorizing committee is here as well. And Mr. Walsh is here from the appropriations uh, uh, side at this point. I'll proceed now uh, for an opening, uh, opening statement. This joint hearing uh, with the authorizing and appropriation subcommittees on the District of Columbia is a beginning, not an end, of a critically important process. As a representative of the state which produced George Washington, I look forward to the day when the nation's capital city, like the man who gave it life, will once again be first in the hearts of the people of America. No one can doubt that the district faces a serious financial crisis. But the crisis is more than unfavorable numbers on a balance sheet. It is a crisis in the lives of the men, women, and above all, the children who live in the district. Although we are going to spend much of today looking at the financial condition of the city, we must never lose sight of the fact that the financial crisis is important because of the devastation it brings to the lives of the district's least powerful residents. As we work together to solve this crisis, we must be careful that the needs of the weak and powerless are met. I challenge the mayor and the city council to work with us to make sure that this happens. Just so that everyone understands today what faces the District of Columbia, it is neither a revenue problem nor a budget problem. Rather, the District of Columbia faces a spending problem of monumental proportions and a management failure to enforce controls or implement reductions. 
These spending and management problems are so severe that the district's government cannot deliver the basic services needed by its citizens. GAO will testify that 43% of the district spending goes to personnel costs. By contrast, only 39% of total spending goes to social services. Blaming almost all the crisis on social service spending alone is not correct or acceptable. Five years ago, the Riverland Commission stated that the district government, even considering its county and state activity, has about 40% more employees per 10,000 residents than comparable cities. Program costs can change from year to year because of outside actions, including eligibility rules and benefit levels. But personnel costs are permanent and will only go up over time. This is where the permanent solution has to come. Serious and real personnel reductions of a magnitude not yet contemplated simply must enter into the equation. GAO, GAO will tell us that so far in FY 1995, which is now almost half over, the district has conspicuously failed to implement the type of dramatic spending reductions and financial controls that are the only avenue left to deal with the situation. In fact, the spending rates remain the same as before. The mayor's transition team delivered a report on the city's finances on November 22nd. It included numerous proposals for resolving the city's crisis. The most important recommendation was that no new revenues are necessary. This recommendation was made for two reasons. The district not only levies sufficient taxes and fees to pay for any reasonable level of services, conspicuously fails to collect millions of dollars owed to it, but it also is there, no, there is really no more blood left in the turnip to squeeze. District receipts from some taxes have already begun to fall because business and residents are being taxed right out of town. The district is important to all Americans as our nation's capital. As such, it has a special claim on all our affections. But it has added importance to the people of the metropolitan Washington area. We know that without an economically vibrant and healthy central city, the strength of the suburbs will be dissipated. We cannot allow this to happen. We all must remember that the city and the suburbs have the same interests. The citizens and representatives of this entire region have a vital stake in the solution to the short and long-range problems of the district. We must all work together so that we don't all fail together. America's capital deserves no less. The two subcommittees are beginning this process together. We will finish this process the same way. In conjunction with our counterpart subcommittees in the Senate and with the federal executives, we will embark upon individual hearings and investigations. In the end, we will carefully examine the reality of District of Columbia finances and budgeting, what the city government has said it will do and what it has actually done about these problems, and then decide what the federal response needs to be. I have not prejudged any final action. I know that my colleagues have not prejudged either. Once we have gotten past the immediate fiscal crisis, my subcommittee will be holding hearings to find out more about living, working, sanitary, health, crime, education, and other conditions that affect the lives of the people of Washington, D.C. We will want to hear from residents, students, parents, and other people who spend much of their time struggling to make this capital city one that is truly worthy of a great nation. By working together, we can transform this city. It will enable Washington to become the preeminent symbol of the rebirth of urban American civilization. I now yield to Mr. Walsh for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, and good morning, colleagues. <clears throat> Allow me to also welcome our witnesses here this morning. This is our first hearing of our subcommittee for this historic 104th Congress. And I'm very pleased that it is a joint hearing with both House committees that are directly involved with the District of Columbia. The Committee on Government Oversight, uh, Reform and Oversight, their subcommittee for the district, and the Appropriations Committee subcommittee on the District of Columbia. Our subcommittee is responsible for financial oversight and for appropriating the proper sums to meet our constitutional responsibility to the district. I want to thank my colleague from Virginia, Tom Davis, for hosting this joint hearing today. We have a big job ahead of us, and it's going to take all of us pulling together and in the same direction if we are to be successful and make our nation's capital the jewel that it should be in the eyes of the world. Let me take a moment to introduce the members of our subcommittee uh, on appropriations. Um, many of them are not yet here uh, because we are all engaged in markups and other hearings this morning, but uh, Mr. Benia of Texas, who was on this subcommittee uh, the last two years, Mr. Kingston of Georgia, 
Mr. Freelinghuisen of New Jersey, who's just joined us, uh, Mr. Newman of Wisconsin, and uh, on the minority side, Mr. Dixon of California is here with us. He, he is our ranking member. He was the chairman of this subcommittee in prior years. Our roles have been reversed, uh, but our relationship remains strong. Uh, Mr. Durbin of Illinois uh, and Ms. Kaptur of Ohio are also former members of the subcommittee. I'd like to say at the outset that I recognize that the district is facing very serious financial problems, not unlike those in other jurisdictions in this country. Philadelphia, New York, and Cleveland are three cities that have had similar problems, and it required a Herculean effort by the entire community, the political establishment, the business community, and the residents to bring those cities back from the brink. Mayor Giuliani just last week proposed a budget for New York City that according to press reports includes the largest reduction in overall spending since the Great Depression and will probably result in restructuring of the government to become leaner and more efficient because the revenues are just not there anymore. We, dealing with the District of Columbia, must make a similar decision. We cannot continue business as usual. And the first step is to find out where we are financially. The General Accounting Office has been looking into the district's finances for almost a year now. Their uh, uh, audit of the district books that, presented, that was presented to us last June uh, helped to guide us into the, uh, the last appropriation cycle for 1995. And it was very, very helpful. And I'm, ho I'm hopeful that uh, that information will continue to guide us in the direction we need to go. We'll hear from, from them first this morning, and then we will hear from Mayor, uh, Mayor Barry and Council Chairman Clark. I cannot overemphasize the need for everyone to be honest and forthcoming. This is the beginning of a long, hard road that both of our subcommittees are going to be traveling to bring the district to fiscal reality. This is not speech making, a speech-making day, but I feel I have to say loud and clear that we have to change the way things are done. The fiscal year 1995 District of Columbia Appropriations Act passed the House last year by three votes. And that was after the committee forced the district to cut $140 million from the city's budget request. It was only four years ago that the, city, the new city administration received an additional $100 million from the Congress in federal payment, plus the authority to borrow $330 million in addition to retire the so-called accumulated deficit. In addition, within those first eight months of her new administration, federal legislation was approved to allow the mayor in an 18-month window to bypass the personnel regulations and selectively reduce the workforce. That same bill also gave the mayor the authority to reduce budgets of independent agencies. All the tools that were requested were provided. Four years later, the district, the district is technically insolvent. The current liabilities exceed current assets, and the district is, for all intents and purposes, out of cash. One of our objectives is to find where the money has gone and where the district is today. After the, this joint hearing today, our two subcommittees will begin having separate hearings on the district's finances and structure. So while this hearing is intended to shed some light on the issue, we will be addressing these issues in greater detail in future hearings. It saddens me to see the district in the condition that it is in, and I would rather be focusing my attention on other issues. But the Congress has a constitutional responsibility for the District of Columbia, and we as members cannot lose sight of that fact. That is why we are here this morning. While I would rather the district's financial situation were different, I welcome the challenges that are ahead of us. All of our actions thus far have been bipartisan. This is an issue that requires total cooperation among district government, the Congress, and the executive branch of the federal government. This is our city. This is the people's city. And we cannot afford to fail. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman Walsh. I now recognize the delegate uh, from the District of Columbia, who I think is courageously open to public discussion. Uh, of this situation. This hearing is not about policy debates or initiatives, but I cannot help but acknowledge your help in taking up the gauntlet. Mrs. Norton. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Jim Walsh, 
and Chairman Tom Davis deserve both thanks and praise for convening this unusual joint hearing to help meet the demands of these unusual times. I welcome the testimony of Mayor uh, Marion Barry and Council Chairman David Clark who are working with indefatigable energy to resolve a mounting crisis. I welcome also John Hill and his colleagues of the GAO whose indispensable service to both committees and to the district has been thoroughly professional. The district's problems are both a replay of serious and similar problems confronting many large cities and a unique version of the urban crisis of the 1990s. With its unique disabilities, however, the wonder is that the district followed rather than led the way, uh, led to led the way to the serious fiscal calamity that overtook cities such as New York and Cleveland as early as the 1970s. The reason the district did not come earlier to this crossroad of crisis, ironically, is because of self-help. Congress froze the federal payment between 1985 and 1990. It was not the federal government but the district's own taxpayers who made up for the absence of a state and county to share the increasing cost of functions borne by no other city. The district drew from its own resources, especially its middle income and business tax base, until it used some up and sent others scurrying. The city did not foresee and act early to avoid the crisis, a myopia common for jurisdictions that live close to the people. In the process, however, the district grew and overgrew its government. Yet only a city with underlying strength could have held on for so long. Even today, most cities would envy the district's population. Among the 25 largest cities, most would not mind being first in percentage of residents employed in the top tier jobs those in the professional managerial and technical categories, third in percentage of residents with college degrees, and fifth in per capita income. As recently as the 1980s, the district had the, had the greatest decline in the poverty rate among the top 25. I recite these hopeful statistics to document the optimism that I believe is fully justified even as the crisis saps the city's strength. But I am no starry-eyed optimist. The district's potential will, will be lost unless the city and the Congress are willing to look straight into the eye of this crisis, refuse to blink, stare it down, and dispose of it. The city's able leaders are hard at work but the time has come to rise above the false hope that day-to-day -day crisis management can get us out of this deep hole. We are pretending as if our message, we are pretending if our message to anxious district residents is that we should keep doing what we're doing, only harder and faster. There is no expenditure of effort or speed of action by which the district using the single strategy of downsizing can cut its way out of this problem in a single fiscal year. The prospect of damage to vital services makes it irresponsible even to try. By saying the obvious, my message is surely not that the mayor or the city council should slow down. For the sake of the city's credibility and their own, they must indeed continue to work harder and faster. That is what they are now doing, and I want to applaud them publicly for their efforts. It is easy enough to underestimate the personal and political difficulty of their task from on high in the Congress or from the sidelines of the press. The mayor and the city council live within shouting distance of the people whose jobs they are taking, whose medical services they are withdrawing, and whose programs they are eliminating. The mayor and the city council are also motivated, however, by the desire to assure that the crisis does not damage home rule. Thus, they continue to wrestle with a problem that has grown larger than they ever imagined and has ballooned far too big to handle. 
it is time for the Congress to join with the district to take the next inevitable step. With the district's loss of its credit last week, an oversight board is now the only way for the city to borrow in order to stay in business. Either such a board will ease the way to the Treasury or the Congress will dictate terms of borrowing that will have obvious and painful home rule implications. I prefer a board designed by the Congress in conjunction with the district to waiting for the Congress to act alone if the district goes bankrupt. I prefer to join the action now rather than to be acted upon later. The district must not be a voyeur watching itself go down. An oversight board can bring another vital element of relief. Only with a board will, we'll be, will we be able to convince this Congress that the district must not be made to eat a deficit that keeps rising like yeast in a single year. This necessity goes beyond the impossibility uh, the short of the short time left to do so much cutting. Cutting is the least of it. It is the opportunity for improved services that is the silver lining in this crisis. We will miss it entirely if we require the district to slash and burn its government to meet what has become an impossible deadline. As in other cities, an oversight board could help the district divide the deficit into an enforceable multi-year plan to meet twin goals of equal experience, of equal importance. One, reduce the deficit while balancing the budget, and two, improve the quality of services for school children and foster children, for the elderly and for homeowners, for the working poor and the homeless, for families and the middle class. If service improvement is not given equal importance with downsizing, what is left of our middle class will use the occasion of this crisis to make their final exit. Only an oversight board can buy the time and the space to make service improvement and deficit reduction equal parts of the same equation. Also, and ominously, without an oversight board, we are left to wonder how the district will be able to float long-term bonds for an arena and convention center, even one that will be paid for by private parties. These two money makers are nothing to fool around with. Almost alone, they make the case for an oversight board. Finally, only a board can give a credible voice that the Congress will hear to the district's strong case for greater revenues. The city's plea that it can no longer carry state and county functions falls mostly on deaf congressional ears today. No one over here wants to hear the, that the district gets 50 percent of its revenues from falling local income property and sales taxes, while the average city gets only 15 percent from such city sources. In the House, my bill for tax relief for the district waits in line behind the crisis. And in the present climate, it has been possible for the Congress to pass over its part of the present crisis, especially the 10 percent of our operating budget that goes to pay for pensions because of a debt created entirely by the Congress and tossed to the district in an unfunded pension plan. The district has nothing to fear from an oversight board that it has had a part in creating, only from an oversight board that will be inevitably imposed unilaterally if the city suddenly goes bankrupt. Council member Kevin Chavis, who has worked for months on his own review board bill, has already shown the way to master rather than succumb to fate. By coming forward now, we are sure that the Congress will do what must be done with the district, not to the district. Throughout this ordeal, my overarching goal has been to help preserve and expand home rule, a temporary board notwithstanding. If an oversight board is established now, it can be designed so as to have minimal impact on home rule. I prefer a model that allows a district to retain all of its powers 
with the board working either directly with elected officials or acting as a review body. We can design a board that leaves home rule entirely intact. What we need, however, is not the home rule status quo, but more home rule. Yet we all know that increased empowerment for the district is a lost cause unless we can put this crisis definitively and permanently behind us. If no city has ever climbed out of a crisis this deep by itself, let us bring on the board, help structure it ourselves, and get past this painful moment. Let me close with a confession. To tell the truth, I want to do what it takes to banish this crisis quickly, not only to reduce the deficit or save home rule, or even to save the children. Like many of my constituents, I want this crisis gone to reclaim the full measure of civic pride in my birthplace and hometown. Washingtonians have heard me speak about my great-grandfather Richard Holmes, the ancestor who laid down our family roots in Washington before the Civil War. Richard was no heroic runaway slave. I think of him as a walkaway slave. He just walked away from a Virginia plantation to freedom in the district. Great-grandfather Richard did not walk here to freedom only to have his family surrender a century later to the bondage of insolvency. Richard figured out how to pick himself up and move on. We in the district must be ready to do no less. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Norton, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much. I'd like to now recognize the chairman of our full uh, committee, uh, Honorable uh, William Klinger. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I just want to very briefly uh, commend you and Mr. Walsh and the members of your committee, subcommittees for holding this hearing in a very expeditious way. We clearly have a crisis of monumental proportions. And the quicker we begin to deal with it, uh, the better for us all. I've had an opportunity to review uh, the GAO report, which we're going to hear about this morning. It is indeed a chilling document, in my view, and one that uh, calls for very, very rapid action. I don't view this hearing <clears throat> this morning as, as a time for finger-pointing or laying of blame. Uh, that may come later when we review how we got here. But certainly the issue before us today is how do we deal with this immediate crushing crisis that we have in the city. And I think uh, that is what I hope that we're going to hear addressed by, uh, by the mayor and by the uh, council. Uh, Mr. Walsh indicated that uh, Washington uh, is not alone, that uh, many cities are having extremely difficult uh, financial problems. But we are unique because it is the capital city, and therefore it gets a, a greater degree of national attention. Uh, when the city get, uh, gets into a fiscal crisis. And it's also unique in that it's the only city where there is this, uh, this uh, federal uh, presence and the federal partnership. I just want to assure you, uh, Mr. Davis, uh, that as chairman of the full committee, I want to uh, pledge you my full support and cooperation as you and Mr. Walsh work toward uh, resolving these problems and coming up with a uh, both a short-term solution as rapidly as possible, but also addressing the longer-term uh, problems that we are going to have to deal with down the road. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chairman Klinger. Uh, Ms. Norton. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent that the, the statement of the ranking member of the full committee, uh, Representative Cardis Collins, be included in the record. Yeah, without objection. Uh, Mr. Walsh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I will at this time yield to our distinguished ranking member, Mr. Dixon of California, if he has an opening statement. Mr. Chairman, I have no opening statement. And now uh, <clears throat> ask our Vice Chairman, Mr. Gutnick, if you have an opening statement. Mr. Chairman, I uh, don't want to go on too long, but I do want to say a couple of things. And first of all, I, th I don't want to be redundant either. I think uh, the city faces uh, some immediate cash crunch problems. Uh, but long term, and I was privileged to have been in the meeting yesterday with uh, the speaker, uh, he expressed hope that long term we can once again turn the, the city of Washington into a city that all Americans can be proud of. And uh, so I think there will be cooperation uh, from those of us on Capitol Hill as long as uh, there's open and honest cooperation from those in the city. And I want to participate in that. I look forward to this hearing and, and future hearings to, uh, to try and get the city back on the right track. Thank you. Mr. Walsh? 
Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to uh, mention the, f the fact that Mr. Kingston of Georgia has now joined us, as has Mr. Bonilla of Texas, who is a, uh, has been on this committee for the last few years, and, and ask them if they have any uh, uh, opening statement to make at this time. Uh, Chairman, thank you. At this time, I have no opening statement, but I will have questions uh, after we hear from the witnesses this morning. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, the only thing I have to say, I think, has already been said that um, uh, Washington is, of course, the United States capital, but more importantly, in the down-home sense, it's American's town, and we want it to be great. We want it to be everything that it can be, and look forward to the process, and thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Yield back, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, Ms. McHugh, any opening statement? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll uh, heed the advice of my good friend and New York State colleague, Chairman Walsh, when he said there's not a moment for speech making and uh, ask uh, unanimous consent to enter uh, into the record an opening statement. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Lotterer, any opening statement? Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity and the uh, interest and expediency of time. I would also ask unanimous consent to uh, place my opening remarks right. on the record and yield back my time. Okay, with that objection, Mr. Flanagan, any opening statement? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also would ask unanimous consent to place my remarks in the record, and uh, I, thank you. I thank the witnesses for coming today. It should be a, a very interesting hearing. Without objection. Chairman Walsh? Uh, Mr. <coughs> Mr. Friedling, do you have any opening statement? Uh, no, uh, no statement, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, this subcommittee is in a receipt of a letter from the Chairman of the Government Reform and Oversight Committee requiring that all witnesses appearing before the subcommittee must be sworn. So, Mr. Hill, if at this time, if you and your colleagues uh, they're, they're with you could stand we'd, and raise your right hand. So, do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? We do. Okay, thank you. Thank you for being here uh, today, uh, Mr. Hill, and you can introduce uh, the members uh, uh, with you. Let me start by saying how thankful we are for the work that you and the other folks have done. I think that in the long run, the district government will thank you as well, because without your past and future efforts, there's no question that the District of Columbia would be uh, in, in more dire shapes than they are now. You may proceed. Chairman Davis, Chairman Walsh, ranking minority members and members of the subcommittee. Accompanying me at the table are Terry Carnahan, Ed Stevenson, and Laura Triggs. As I proceed through my statement, Paul Caban and Chris Warwick will also, also of my staff will point out important information contained on the charts we will be using. Although it is a pleasure to appear before you today, and I certainly appreciate the kind words that you have for the work that we've done, the District of Columbia's financial condition um, is in, I only wish that I could present better news today. The district's cash position is especially precarious. Given the continued spending at current levels, it is now clear that the district will run out of cash as early as this summer. In fact, the district could be considered insolvent since it does not have enough cash to pay all of its bills, and future sources of funds are uncertain. In our report and testimony of last summer, we explained the phenomenon of the district's dwindling cash balances during periods of balanced budgets. Last fall, in response to the growing financial crisis, Congress mandated $140 million in reductions of expenditures from those requested by the district for fiscal year 1995. They also reduced the federal payment by $14 million and took several actions intended to enforce these provisions and improve the quality and timeliness of information reported to the Congress. Despite these actions, the district's financial situation has continued to deteriorate and the quality and timeliness of information provided to the Congress has not improved. Earlier this month, the district's annual financial statement for fiscal year 1994 reported the largest annual deficit since home rule. The district deferred payment of more than 500 million in bills at the end of fiscal year 1994. Last December, to meet a critical cash need, the district had to obtain 250 million in short-term borrowing months earlier than the cash forecast had shown this money would be needed. And just last week, two financial investment services lowered the district's bond rating, one of them to below investment grade or junk bond status. Without decisive and immediate action, prospects for the district's future financial condition continue to be bleak. As I will explain in more detail in a minute, the district has abandoned its earlier plans to close the spending gap on its own and now plans to seek substantial federal assistance. 
According to the district's own estimates, fiscal year 1995 expenditures could be nearly $3.9 billion, $631 million above the $3.25 billion congressionally mandated spending cap. At this spending rate, current appropriations law could reduce the district's 1996 federal payment to zero if the district exceeds spending caps and its budget authority. My written statement contains details of the evolution of the district's financial crisis, congressional action related to the 1995 budget, our analysis of the district's 1995 first quarter financial report, the district's recent actions to address the financial crisis, and the district's cash situation. Over the last several months, there have been many different numbers reported about the size of the district budget and the cash problem. I will briefly summarize the most significant points in my written statement and attempt to shed some light on these numbers. Our efforts to obtain accurate and reliable data have been hampered by the poor state of the district's financial systems. Some data may need to be adjusted as we continue our work. Included as attachment one of my statement and on the chart that's shown on the side here is a timeline of major events that have occurred since we issued our report last summer. As I go through my statement, it may be useful to refer to this timeline. In the 1980s, the district's general fund operated with revenues in excess of expenditures in most years. From 1991 through 1993, the district submitted budgets to the Congress that showed expenditures and receipts in balance. However, even though the budgets were balanced, and despite receiving cash from a $331 million general obligation borrowing in 1991, the city's cash position continued to decline. During that period, various factors helped the district to balance its budget, including nearly $400 million in increased federal payments and $225 million in additional budgetary authority from uh, transferring money from water and sewer funds, not recording Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority payments when due, and changing the legal definition of the property tax year. After three years of positive general fund balances, the district recorded a $335 million deficiency for fiscal year 1994. Of this total deficiency, $116.8 million was in appropriated funds, where deficiencies recorded in most appropriated expenditures, functions, and subfunctions, including the schools, Medicaid, fire, police, public works. The remaining amount resulted primarily from adjustments related to Medicaid and D.C. General Hospital. The Medicaid increase relates to cost settlements of prior year Medicaid program costs that the district will be required to re repay during fiscal year 1995. The 85 million adjustment for the D.C. General Hospital receivable recognizes that the D.C. General Hospital loans from the general fund may be uncollectible since the hospital continues to operate at a substantial loss. Figure one on page four of my written statement that is also reproduced in a chart illustrates the cash problem the district faces at the end of each fiscal year. As you can see, each year a larger portion of the federal payment is being used to pay the prior year bills. Both the Appropriation Act of 1995 and the Federal Payment Reauthorization Act require that the mayor submit a quarterly financial report. To respond to this requirement, on January 17th, the district submitted more than 500 pages of documents. Although some valuable information was included in this data, for the most part, the information was not in a form that is useful to monitor the district's finances. The quarterly report included a computer run to show first quarter expenditures. This run did not contain summaries or analyses of data, and there were no projections of expenditures for the remainder of the fiscal year. This makes it impossible to use this report to compare actual first quarter expenditures with budgeted amounts or to project the year-end expenditures. The legislation called for an aging of payables and an aging of receivables. The list of payables included the date the voucher was entered in the district's financial management system rather than the date of the voucher. Since in an effort to control cash, vouchers were held for extended periods before being entered into the system, this date does not reflect the true age of the payable. The quarterly financial report included some data on the district's number of FTE personnel for various periods. 
However, the district did not submit information on the actual number of full-time, part-time, and temporary employees and the source of funding for these employees as required by the legislation. We have agreed going forward that we will assist the district in developing a more useful format for future quarterly financial reports. Information on the exact number of district personnel is difficult to verify. Different sources of funding and the lack of an integration between the personnel, payroll, and budgeting systems makes it very difficult to establish the exact number of personnel on board. District personnel positions are financed by both appropriated and non-appropriated funds. The district reports personnel data in a variety of ways, including FTEs, the number of personnel receiving paychecks, and full-time onboard staff. An FTE is used to measure the number of equivalent positions and takes into account how many hours are actually being worked. For example, two employees working half-time would be counted as one FTE. The D.C. Fiscal Year 1995 Appropriation Act required that the number of FTE positions financed from appropriated funds not exceed 33,588, which is 2,000 FTEs below the 35,588 contained in the 1995 budget. Table 2 on page 9 of my written statement shows information on district FTEs. On February 17th, the district announced that it had reduced the number of FTEs by 3,585 to 32,530. This total is below the 33,588 required in, this, in the legislation, but further explanation is needed. Although the district said it cut more than 3,000 positions, some of these positions were not filled as of the end of fiscal year 1994. Specifically, as of September 1994, there were 33,675 actual FTEs on board. Therefore, the actual reduction since the beginning of the fiscal year in actual FTEs is 1,145. In making the announcement on February 17th, the district outlined the specific reductions by agency that had occurred because of incentive retirement programs and, and attrition. However, the number of reductions reported are significantly higher than the actual decline in FTEs. Several specific examples might highlight these seeming inconsistencies. Metropolitan Police Department, the district announce, uh, announcement showed 347 staff departures. The actual FTE data showed 162 fewer FTEs. The Department of Human Services, the district's announcement showed 713 staff departures. The actual FTE data showed 464 fewer FTEs. And DC Public Schools, the district announcement showed 90 staff departures. The actual FTE data showed an increase of 404 FTEs. The district explained that some vacant positions would be refilled due to court orders or other mandates. We are continuing to develop and review information on district personnel. During the first part of fiscal year 1995, the district's attention was almost entirely on efforts to obtain the $250 million in short-term borrowing. The key action during this period of time was a consensus agreement among the D.C. Council Chairman and then Mayor and Mayor-elect that included management actions and initiatives to reduce potential overspending and cut cost. A budget that would show $140 million in budget cuts mandated by the Congress and a positive cash forecast. Table 3 on page 11 of my statement outlines the Council actions from last December. The D.C. Council passed a revised budget on December 21st that included expenditure reductions and revenue increases of $448 million and increased agency allocations and reprogrammings of $309 million. The net reduction of $139 million included only $90 million in expenditure cuts and $40 million in additional revenue. The net amount essentially equaled the $140 million congressional mandate, but the Congress had ordered that all of the $140 million in, expenditure, in cuts come from expenditures. On February 7th, the Council rescinded the $40 million revenue increase, reducing the net Council actions on the fiscal year 1995 budget to $99 million. Although the net result of the Council action has been $99 million in cuts, these reductions have not been allocated to approve spending plans. The District Government 
also adopted an apportionment procedure in an attempt to control spending, but this process does not appear to be reducing spending either. The district directed agencies to limit spending to 25% of their appropriation in the first quarter and 15% in the second quarter. However, these, ap these apportionments were also based on the originally submitted pre-140 million cut budget. In addition, the apportionment process would only delay rather than reduce expenditures. Several district agency officials have told us that personnel expenditures alone in the second quarter would exceed the 15% apportionment. For example, DC General Hospital officials said that payroll costs in the second quarter would consume all of their apportionment, and fire and emergency medical services officials said that the February 17th firefighting payroll put them over their allocation. DC schools said that all of their allocation would be expended when they pay the March 1 teacher payroll. Although the district is continuing to process payroll, even though the apportionments are being exceeded, agency officials told us that the result is that they have no funds to purchase supplies. Fire and emergency medical services officials said that their inability to purchase supplies could be an extremely serious condition. The apportionment process also does not apply to entitlement payments such as Medicaid, as any entitled pay in payment is approved regardless of the agency's apportionment limit. On February 1, 1995, the mayor announced overspending in the district agencies could result in a $3.89 billion in expenditures, or $631 million over the $3.25 billion expenditure limit established by the Congress. The district said that this deficiency was comprised of Medicaid cost settlements and adjustments, agency over expenditures, and the required $140 million in congressionally mandated cuts. In addition, the mayor explained that there was a $91 million cash shortage, making the total shortfall come to $722 million. Table 4 on page 13 of my written statement, which also has been reproduced as a chart, um, should be referred to. To address the, 60, the $631 million in agency overspending, the district has proposed that $267 million of the shortfall be covered by additional funds from the federal government and that the Congress rescind the $140 million in budget cuts. Rescinding the $140 million would allow the district to use the surplus budget authority built into the district budget when the Congress ordered the cuts and eliminate this portion of the penalty outlined in the Appropriation Act. The remaining $224 million would be addressed by the district's spending reductions as identified in agency spending plans. However, many of the cuts in these plans are not specific and in some cases have already been superseded by other events. The district has informed us that it will formally submit a revised supplemental budget for fiscal year 1995 to the district council by March 8th. Adjustments to this basic framework could occur. Table 5 on page 14 discusses some of the issues related to Medicaid spending um, and budget changes. The largest action in the district's plan to close the revenue and spending gap in fiscal year 1995 is receiving $267 million in additional federal payment, ostensibly because of Medicaid. The district said that the appropriated portion of Medicaid expenditures would climb to $550 million in fiscal year 1995, or $267 million more than the congressionally approved budget. The district estimate of $260 million includes $152 million that is not needed in cash for fiscal year 1995. Routine medical, Medicaid cost adjustments that occur after the fiscal year has ended are not new, and the amount of cost changes have grown. Until this fiscal year, anticipated costs such as the $82 million would not be included in current year budget expenditures. The expenditures resulted from such cost settlements resulting from such cost settlements are rolled forward to the next fiscal year and included in budgets for that year. The net effect of this budget change is an $82 million increase in budgeted expenditures for fiscal year 1995 and a corresponding increase in the projected deficiency. Furthermore, the $82 million increases the district's proposed cash needs to $267 million for the Medicaid program while the related payments would not be made until sometime in fiscal year 1996 or later. The district's estimated 
needs of the 600, uh, 267 million also include 30 million in cost savings planned for fiscal year 1995 and another 40 million representing Medicaid costs that one district agency pays to a component of that agency. Accordingly, 152 million of the 267 million in cash the district plans to ask from the federal government will not be needed to pay for expenditures in fiscal year 95 and represents cash that has the risk of being used for other purposes. As we noted earlier, the district has had cash problems over the last few years. The overspending outlined and the district's own admission that additional federal revenues are needed to balance the budget demonstrate that the district will run out of cash unless additional funds are obtained. The chart in front of you is uh, reproduced from table six on page 16 of my written statement. The district's most recent class flow projections for fiscal year 1995 were included as a part of the quarterly financial report. The statement projected that the ending cash balance for fiscal year uh, 95 will be $50 million, but this projection is based on many unapproved actions, double counting of some items, and other unsupported financial data. When taken together, these questionable items result in a cash projection of negative $400 million at the end of the fiscal year. The chart also includes the impact on cash of the $224 million in additional overspending identified by the mayor on February 1st. Because some of this overspending involves budget procedures, a change in budget procedures, approximately $72 million of this overspending could affect cash, thus increasing the projected year-end cash deficit to nearly half a billion dollars if these initiatives are not successfully implemented. In summary, Mr. Chairman, and I apologize for the length of time that it's taken for me to deliver this oral statement, the district is facing an enormous financial crisis which has increased since our report in June. Dist the district projected and actual spending is significantly above the approved budgets, and the district has cash now only because it is not paying hundreds of millions in bills. The district's plans uh, to address the current financial situation uh, must include major structural and management initiatives in order for those uh, plans to be effective. The district faces even greater revenue and expenditure gaps in the future, so it is important that action be taken immediately. That controls my oral statement. My colleagues and I will be glad to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much uh, for that testimony, uh, Mr. Hill. I hope that Every member here, as well as the uh, district officials, are listening carefully, and I also hope that many ordinary residents of the city listened as well, because this may be the first time that they can truly understand how badly off the District of Columbia is and what actions have to be brought to uh, remedy this situation. I'd like to uh, start, if I could, um, to start the questioning by having you go over the $335 million deficit for FY 1994 reported in the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. Could you break those numbers down and explain the components of, the, of that total? Yes. Yeah. Um, there were a number of pieces in um, the uh, 335 million deficiency. Um, several of the pieces related specifically to uh, Medicaid accruals that were being made um, in order to uh, account for expenditures um, that had not been paid yet but they were certainly due to Medicaid um, activities in, in the uh, uh, prior year um, and, and for that current year. Um, also, there were amounts, there was a reserve for the D.C. General receivable of $85 million, <coughs> which was basically loans that were made to the D.C. General Hospital. Um, actually, we consider those loans to be made in lieu of subsidies given to the hospital. Um, it became clear to us last year that these amounts were not indeed loans, but they were actually subsidies that were being made to the district, uh, to the general hospital. Well, let me, so that the FY 1994 deficit, as it actually impacts 1995 spending, would be, because that 85 million would be reduced to, to about 250 million, just taking that 85 million out of it? Um, it, it would be reduced if you uh, took the 85 million out okay. of it. Okay. Let me ask then, about the 103 million Medicaid costs added to the FY 1994 deficit, are those real numbers that have a cash impact on 1995 spending? Uh, yes. Okay. 
what is the FY 1994 deficit carryover that actually impacts on FY 1995 spending? Get a ballpark for Um, it would it would pretty much be some of the um, allowances and accruals that they are are making. In fact, we have referred to um, the total amount on one of the charts. It might be a good idea to go back to uh, the Medicaid chart, which is included in the the testimony. I guess the other question is, how do you run deficits in non-appropriated uh, accounts? Well, one of the ways that you run a deficit in a non-appropriated account um, is by uh, actually recording the accrual in that account in lieu of recording that accrual in the appropriated funds. If they had actually budgeted for those amounts in um, the appropriated funds, then those would be recorded in um, the appropriated funds. The eight, 85 million is a very good example since we view those as um, basically amounts that should have been uh, considered subsidies to the hospital, uh, those amounts um, we feel should have been included in the appropriated funds. Okay. Are you going to go back to the um, deficit carryover impacting the FY95 spending? We're going to go yeah, back. I'm going to let uh, Laura, could you take that? Yeah, Laura. On the Medicare spending. The, the 103 million that you see in the 335 is the amount estimated to be paid in, in 1995. The difference between what's here on the, the deficit and 1995 budget is there's an additional 82 million added into the 95 expenditure budget that may or may not affect cash. So the number that you see in the 94 statements could affect cash in 94, but it's the additional piece that's added for 1995. Basically, you have two years in 1995 and it's that additional piece that may not affect cash in 95. Okay. I guess my last question, and you alluded to it in your remarks, but I wonder if you could clarify it, is right now under the Appropriations Act that Congress passed in the last session and was signed by the President, to the extent the district spends over $3.25 uh, billion, they have a return back to the Federal Treasury dollar for dollar for every dollar they're overspent. Um, well, it's... it's Certainly, it's a return dollar for dollar, but well, it's, it's also... Well, it's a cut in the expenditure, right? But, but, but it's in, also... In the appropriation. That's right. And it could very well, at the rates that we're looking at right now, it could very well eat up the entire federal payment for 1996. Okay. I mean, and that's the, that's the current state of the law, and any change in that would have to come from uh, probably Mr. Walsh's committee. Exactly. As they, as, they, as they look at that. All right, thanks. At this point, I will uh, yield to Mr. Walsh, recognize the gentleman from New York. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank the GAO for their testimony today and for the work that they've done. I know this is a, uh, it, it's, it's not fun to be, to be coming up with this kind of information, uh, and, uh, but you've done an excellent job and, and it's helped us. Um, I would like to ask a rather obvious question to me, but uh, the answer I think is obvious, but I'd like to ask it again. Has the district met its commitments to the federal government based on the 1995 Appropriations Act, which called for a cut of $140 million, uh, a reduction of full-time filled positions of 2,000, quarterly reports, um, and, well, those three. Um, we would see, we see no plans that indicate that the district will only spend 3.2 uh, billion dollars uh, this year. In fact, the plans indicate that they will go over. So in that regard, no, they have not met that commitment. And we saw um, some deficiencies, a number of deficiencies in the um, report, the first quarter report. And so we do have, have problems with them having met that requirement as well. So it's clear to you, based on the analysis that you've done, that the district has not met its commitments to the federal government for the 1995 appropriation. Yes, and I think it should be pointed out as well that um, the budget that the Congress started with was a budget that was the request from the district, so that uh, the Congress cut what was requested only by $140 million. So, but that starting point was an amount given from the district. Yeah, and that's not a cut in the federal payment. That's a cut in the total appropriation since we appropriate all the money, federal and, and local. Yes, that's true. Um, I'd like to focus just for a second, since the time is so limited, on one issue, and that is uh, it's on page five in your report uh, the, uh, regarding the escrow requirement. 
And the more I look at this, the more I believe that this is what has brought us to this point. Uh, as I understand it, as, uh, assuming the federal payment would be uh, is author, I believe it's authorized at around 660 million. Yes. Uh, the district would be required to put in escrow 20 percent of that amount um, in order to cover any shortfall in spending or any overage in spending that they would be penalized for in '95. So, in fact, if you then refer to the chart on page six. If the district were to overspend by $100 million, the total penalty is actually closer to $200 million. Uh, based on uh, your projections, if there's no federal intervention and we make it through to the end of the year without a, uh, uh, a bankruptcy uh, of the district, what would you estimate that, that including the escrow, what would you estimate that the penalty on the district would be in order to, to uh, for us to process a 96 appropriation? Yeah, it would be the last item on that chart, uh, 631 million overspending. Um, it would be 771 million dollars, which is in excess of the federal payment. Coincidentally, that's the same number that the mayor presented uh, uh, to us uh, several weeks ago as the deficit, but they're totally different numbers, are they not? Um, the, 630, the 631 or the 771? The 770. I believe it was 720 something. 722. Yeah, they're different numbers. Very different numbers. Um, you've said uh, several times that the district is, um, is uh, for all intents and purposes, insolvent and the cash uh, shortfall is severe. Do you believe that the district uh, can you tell us right now how much you believe, how much cash you believe the district has on hand today? Um, no, I don't, I don't have that number. Um, one of the issues with respect to the amounts that the district has on hand is um, the actual cash uh, system that they use in order to determine what their, their cash is. Um, the district certainly knows the amounts that are in their bank accounts. Um, they do know that information. However, um, they have uh, some difficulties in determining the outstanding check, so it would be hard to get an exact number. They basically get a ballpark number. Also, you would have to look at the payables uh, that are outstanding. And um, we have asked, but have not received, a total amount of the payables that are outstanding as of a given date. Several weeks ago, when we met with Mr. Pullman, um I asked him the question, do you know how much money you owe to vendors, how, much, how many uh, bills have been held to maintain whatever positive cash flow there is? And he said he could not answer that. Based on your assessment, should the district be able to answer that question? Um, yes, I, I think that someone should be able to answer that, that question. That's an important question to answer. Um, however, uh, because of the systems that the district is using and also because of the fact that that um, the uh, basically the controller's office really would not know the bills that have come in until they are sent from the agencies right. it would be very difficult for them to find out exactly how much is there unless they go into each individual agency and then really do a search for these bills uh Thank you, Mr. Hill. I, I, uh, I'm going to run out of time real fast, and we will have another opportunity to uh, ask some more questions on Friday when our subcommittee meets. And I thank you for your testimony and for all of your work, all, of, all four of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I now recognize Mrs. Norton for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hill, uh, your team also did a report on the district's unfunded pension liability, uh, did it not? Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you know of any city which is operating at the moment uh, with a pension fund that is totally unfunded? Um, no, I'm not aware of any that is. So that's unique in the United States for the district. Um, how much of, uh, how much of uh, the five billion or so uh, unfunded liability is due to uh, costs uh, to fund 
uh, that go straight to retirees. Okay. Uh, Laura, can you? Well, as you know, the district funds the district funds the payments every year that go um, directly to retirees on an annual basis. The accumulation of the fund balance, the, the unfunded portion of the fund balance, is the estimated payments going forward, and I think that approximates about about three billion. The current payments are between two, 290 and 310 a year for the last two or three years. What amount does the federal government put into uh, this uh, to, 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 to reduce this unfunded pension liability? They're putting in 52 million a year, which represents the present value of um, a certain portion of the payment that when the pension plan was set up at the, end of, at the beginning of home rule. What's the total amount that the district has put into has put to reduce this uh, liability as compared with uh, the federal government since the, since, the, since the matter was transferred to the district? Well, the actual computation for the district is that they are not reducing the unfunded liability, but they're paying the current portion plus some interest on it. So it actually, in actuarial terms, I'm afraid it stays even, but they have paid what will be considered interest over the last 10 years. Uh, has the has the district taken uh, uh, the re the steps prerequisite to uh, uh, resolving? Uh, the district taken what steps it can uh, in order to resolve this pension problem, unfunded pension problem. Um, I am not aware of all of the steps that the district has taken um, to uh, resolve the, the the unfunded pension liability problem. You're not aware so, of the so bill that the that the district has uh, has uh, uh, enacted. Uh, yes, I am aware of the legislation that has been enacted, um, but I'm but you had asked, has the district done everything that they could in order to solve the problem? And we ha I have not uh, reviewed that specifically. How much? Uh, has the district paid out in pension costs that it would not have paid out had the pension plan been fully funded when it was transferred to the district by uh, the Congress? I, 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 I don't have that information. I wish you provide that information for the record. Sure. We'll be more than happy to. Um, your your report does not speak uh, to in any detail to court orders. How much of the district's budget is tied up in court orders? Yeah, um, back in our report in June, um, we had actually looked at the amount of the district's um, budget that was tied up in court orders, and it was a significant portion. Um, it was a hard number for us to come up with because there are several whole programs um, that are tied up in court orders um, so that we couldn't really assess the pieces of the program that were under court order or the actions that had to be taken. It was the whole program. But back in our report in June, we, um, we did have a, uh, some information on that. Um, as, as a matter of fact, we, we saw that a, a significant portion um, of several activities within the district are covered under court orders, uh, such as some of the things that they're doing with corrections, certainly. Um, and, but it was difficult for us to come up with a specific number on that. So, so even, even, even with the best financial management system, it would be difficult to discover that amount? Uh, I mean, is yes. it the financial management system that, that keeps you from knowing that amount, or uh, are there other factors? It's the pervasiveness of some of the court orders um, is, is part of the, the problem because it's hard to determine which portion of the program is under court order. And generally, the actions that have to be taken to solve the court order in many cases involve the entire program. Uh, for instance, um, some of the activities that the district is, is providing under Medicaid right now in terms of optional payments are indeed under court order so that any changes in some of those um, requirements would have to be reconciled with the court order in some way. Can I ask you more about that? Uh, these are optional payments that the district is making uh, to uh, residents on Medicaid and those are uh, mandated on the district so it couldn't get rid of those optional payments at the moment. 
um, it couldn't by itself get rid of those optional payments. There would have to be some um, reconciliation with the, the court order and uh, uh, probably some involvement specifically with, um, um, with, with the court specifically. Uh, those optional uh, payments, um, could those, w was the district sued on those uh, optional payments um, because it had specifically included those payments when it, uh, and would the only way for it to, and would, would, there, any, would there be any way for it to um, get out of those payments without, in fact, passing uh, a law to handle the problem in the future? Mm. Well, we have specifically... To withdraw, to withdraw it from those payments in the future. Yeah, we have specifically requested that information from the district and we have not received it yet um, to take a look at it. And um, as soon as we do, though, we'll be glad to provide our comments for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I see my time has run out. Thank you. Mr. Walsh. Chairman Walsh. Uh, Mr. Dixon. Yes, Ms. Tell, I want to uh, join the members of the committee in congratulating you on the fine work that you've uh, provided us. Thank you. The, uh, you made comments about the uh, non-appropriated budget, uh, but they were very brief. And uh, I'm wondering, as, as we talk about uh, some kind of financial oversight, that uh, whether you would recommend that there be additional controls placed on the non-appropriated budget? Um, I would recommend that the non-appropriated budget also be included with the appropriated budget. Um, the district is uh, somewhat unique in terms of having so much of its uh, budget outside of the appropriation, um, the, the, at least that the Congress would look at. So I, I would recommend that the two be included uh, together, especially be, certainly because of the size. It, 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 is, it is a very large portion of the activity that the district undertakes. I believe the, uh, the appropriated budget deficit for 94 was $117 million. Is that correct? Yes. In your professional opinion, do you believe that this overspending violated the Anti-Deficiency Act? Um, we're currently looking um, uh, into that, and one of the reasons that it is very difficult to tell is because um, with the Anti-Deficiency Act, uh, you have to consider whether or not the payments were made for programs that would be considered entitlement-type programs. And so a definition of entitlement uh, programs as it relates to the district, we would have to first come to grips with that definition and then apply that the um, to the district. So, so we have not determined that, although um, clearly with the magnitude of the overspending, it appears that there may have been violations. Right. In the main, those entitlement programs would be in the non-appropriated budget, would they not? Yes. Yeah, and are you familiar with the statement on page 24, uh, paragraph D, the third uh, section of that, uh, of the CAFR? Yes. Right. Now, assuming uh, uh, that uh, it's um, in violation of the Anti-Deficiency Act, uh, would you say that this would warrant a qualified audit opinion? Um, in terms of the opinion on the financial statement, uh, I can only speak in terms of what GAO would have done uh, on that opinion. And uh, GAO would have brought that information um, up to the opinion. Um, we would have um, certainly had a middle paragraph in the opinion stating that the district was under severe cash um, constraints. And we would have considered qualifying the opinion. And uh, in, in past years, uh, have there been such opinions written? Um, yes, there was. Uh, there was an opinion that was written on the 1990 financial statement uh, by um, Pete Marwick and a number of other uh, CPA firms that, that were part of that. That it was not a qualified opinion, but it did have a middle paragraph that um, indicated that the district was under severe cash constraints. At that time, the deficit was smaller than the deficit is right now, and the cash problems were less severe than the cash problems are now. Representative Norton has raised the issue of the, um, the unfunded liability in, in the pension plan, and, and I agree with her that uh, uh, Congress has to do a better job of 
of uh, funding that. I believe there's $2.7 billion in the fund at the, at the present time. D did your report indicate uh, that it was uh, unfunded? Uh, which, which report? Uh, she asked you about whether you had examined the um, pension plan and you said you had in fact written a report. She used the term unfunded and I just uh, there's a portion that's unfunded. It is unfunded totally in not the, funded, but it is. There's a the portion that is you, funded. That's correct. Right. The question to you, do you know of any jurisdiction, in fact, that has an unfunded plan? Your response was no. Would that, in, would that include Washington? My only point is that we have to do a, a lot better job, but I wouldn't want anyone to go away to think that uh, the $52 million a year and the $2.7 billion is a, a totally unfunded program. That's correct. We right. were talking about any other yeah. city. The total, mis the total liability Hill. is about $5 billion. Right. Thank you, Ms. Triggs. I am rather fuzzy, and I've asked this question many times. To what extent is the unfunded liability, which I think is the federal government's responsibility, uh, causing the, either the cash problem or the long-term uh, problem of the district's finances. Well, it certainly is a contributor since it is about 10 percent of the expenditures every year. Um, there are other cities that have comparable numbers. I don't have the, all those with me, but I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. comparable Exactly. numbers that they do. There are other cities that do have large pension payments that they make on an annual basis. I'd have to look at, get some statistics on that. But it certainly is a contributor being just a, such a large percentage. In other words, if they didn't have to pay roughly 300 and some odd million dollars to the pension plan in any given year, that they could apply that to other parts of the budget. Is that? That's correct. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Dixon. Uh, Mr. Gutnick, any uh, questions at this uh, time? Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Freelingheisen, do you have any questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, what uh, currently exists uh, in the way of a clearinghouse for debt issuances? Is there such a clearinghouse? In other words, I s seem that it seems that the district has been borrowing quite a lot of money, uh, short-term borrowing, long-term borrowing. Is there actually a central point uh, where all these borrowings are reviewed? You mean from the district standpoint? Yes. Well, yes, the Office of Treasury, you could ask the district exactly how they go about doing that. Well, I, I'm asking you, is there, a, is there a central clearinghouse through which uh, all these, uh, yes. there is? And, and to your mind, what is your view of that operation? Um, we, we haven't specifically looked at that particular issue. I mean, we would be more than happy to Well, you have in your report that. through the chair uh, the financial status of the District of Columbia finances from June of 19... 94, a section on, on uh, uh, debt I issuance borrowings. And that uh, whole area raises some questions about the level of debt. C could you quantify for me what, on an annual basis, uh, the district has in the way of short-term borrowings? I mean, put it, putting aside the, the issue for which the dollars are used, it, it seems to me that one of the things that appears to need some controls uh, is the issue, uh, is debt issuance. H how much in an, any given year for short-term short borrowing and how much in terms of long-term debt? Yeah, I, I don't have those numbers um, at my fingertips and, and would prefer to provide that for the record if that would be... Well, I, the reason I raised the question, I'd be happy to have you provide that for the record. In, in your own report, it says here, and I quote, the district's annual appropriation specifically states that, and I quote, uh, the mayor shall not expend any monies borrowed from capital projects for operating expenses of the District of Columbia government. And it goes on, that's end of quote. And a new quote, however, in recent years, the district has borrowed from the Capital <laughs> Projects Fund. And then it goes on to detail those types of borrowings. Problems, is this a problem area? And could you expand on 
their own council has uh, has said that that is uh, appropriate as long as the money is paid back before the end of the fiscal year. Would you, I, I, I saw that statement in this document. Do you agree with that? Yeah, it we, specifically says, and I quote, the dis district corporation council has concluded the district does not violate its appropriation so long as borrowings from the capital projects funds are repaid before the end of the fiscal year in which the borrowing is made. Now, that's in quotation. Now, general practices of good government are that you don't borrow money from a debt issuance uh, for, especially from a capital account, for operating purposes. Now, the General Accounting Office, I assume, agrees with general, these general principles. Yeah, our, the, the thing that we would look at and the thing that we are currently looking at at uh, the request of um, um, uh, Mr. Dixon uh, last year was what happens in terms of capital borrowing um, and does that have an impact on the ability of uh, the capital fund um, to um, actually uh, then go forward with some of the projects that they have. And we are, we are still looking at that issue right now. And so I, I would be more than happy to provide that information. Well, put, to putting you. aside, obviously, the fact the city, city still has to run and fund various programs, right. uh, from my perspective, coming from a, city, from a state where a number of cities have gotten into fiscal trouble, this is one of the areas which most of the people who do those reviews point to is that there has never been a, a single group that reviews uh, uh, these types of bond issuances. Mm -hmm. But you would think that that perhaps would be incorporated in, in what may be developed here? Yes. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Freeling uh, Gentleman from Ohio, any questions? Mr. Latourette. Sorry, I forgot where I was from for a minute, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, Mr. Hill, I want to join my colleagues in thanking you for your, not only your report today, but your previous appearance. And I, I'd like to follow up on some of the observations you made the last time, if I could, and then ask you about a prospective rather than what's wrong, maybe sure. what, what can be done to, to fix the problem. Um, when you were here on February the 3rd, I believe, you, you made an indication that some of the difficulty you were having in, in uh, the audit procedure was the documents that had been requested were not forthcoming from the district. Has that situation been rectified since your last appearance? Um, there has been an improvement in um, the speed with which we're getting uh, those documents. We met directly with uh, the mayor, um, and the mayor has uh, made it a priority um, with his staff to get us documents. However, um, we still have documents that we have not received yet, and we provide a a listing and a status report to the district on a regular basis on um, um, the, the status of whether we've received documents that we've asked for. But there has been some improvement. Okay, thank you. I, I think also last time you were here uh, in briefing this committee, there was a suggestion that uh, in spite of the fact that the district had been required to trim $140 million and make those $140 million in spending cuts, the district agencies were still operating on uh, budgets and spending plans that, that gave no no indication that those spending spending cuts were going to be uh, implemented. Is that still the case? Today? That is still the case. During your testimony today, uh, unless I misunderstood you, did I hear you to say that your review of the uh, the records of the district, uh, are, based upon that review, you're not able to determine how many people are employed by the district? Well. Um, <laughs> In fact, it might be good to um, have uh, Ed Stevenson answer that question uh, because he's the person that did a lot of the work on FTEs. Yeah, the data the district has is, is payroll data. It has uh, budget data, what they call an FTE, which is a full-time equivalent. It's used in the federal government. Uh, they, they also have uh, personnel records. We've tried to get, and we've gotten some data from them on FTEs, uh, to get to get an indication of actually how many people are on board, and that's where why we believe there hasn't been the the kinds of reductions that they've pointed out that there have been. Um, that's basically what we looked at. We looked at the number of FTEs during various periods over the last uh, three years, frankly, and uh, we have not we didn't see the kinds of cuts that they were pointing out. 
we still are pursuing that issue because we don't know, I mean, the personnel office has said there's been 1,850 people leave the District of Columbia from appropriated funds, um, but we only identified uh, 1,145 cuts in FTEs. Uh, what the, there's obviously some kind of difference there, and we're, we're just trying to work on that right now as we continue to look at the personnel issues. Okay. Thank you. And, and I, th I think lastly, in, in the few moments that I have remaining, uh, there have been some questions already indicating that perhaps the unfunded uh, pension liability is a contributing cause. But one of the solutions that's been suggested in documents that we've had the opportunity to review is that it may take a multifaceted approach. One, the, the spending cuts which are, which are envisioned uh, by Congress that the district should engage in. Two, some type of uh, scheme to permit the district to recapture non-residence taxes as those uh, the individuals who live in or work in the district go back to Virginia or Maryland. Uh, and three, that there be a, a, a realignment of the federal payment uh, to compensate the district for, uh, for instance, military personnel that don't pay sales tax and things of that nature. Has it been any part of your charter to do other than to, to analyze the books, but to, to look prospectively as to whether or not some of the solutions, uh, for instance, uh, floated in the McKinsey report of October 1994, would, would solve or move towards solving the dilemmas? Um, what we have been asked to do is to look at what other cities um, who were involved in financial crisis had done in order to solve their, their financial problems. Um, one of the difficulties, however, when you take that information and translate it into the district or to the District of Columbia is that the district is certainly a unique entity. And so currently um, we are um, um, assisting the Congress in its decision making as to what solutions um, might have an impact on the problem. But we have not come up with a solution ourselves um, to, to this problem at this point. Have, have you reviewed uh, or had made available to you the McKinsey report of October yeah. 1994? Yes. Would, would it be possible if asked to uh, make some comments on their suggested solutions? Um, sure, we'd be more than happy to comment on that. Thank you, Mr. Hill. Thank you, thank you Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Kreiser, a gentleman from Michigan. Uh, Mr. Hill, do you know how many people are employed by the District of Columbia in all capacities? Um, no, I do not. Does anybody? We, um, no, we really do not, but we can tell you how many FTEs we think there are, and that's some 44,000. 44, 10,000 of those, I, the difference in the numbers I mentioned before, 10,000 are funded by uh, non-appropriated funds, mainly federal grants. So then the district has almost uh, one employee for every 10 residents, is that right? That's what the math would work out to, yes. But w will, well, the almost 20,000 employees paid from the non-appropriated funds, they're still paid with DC checks and they still receive uh, um, benef DC benefits and pensions? Yeah, it's 10,000, but we think it's 10,000 in FT. Yes, they are still paid through the same payroll systems. That's, that's true, most of them. Most of them. There are, there are different payroll systems in the district, but I believe most of them are paid through the, the same payroll system. Yes. To, to your knowledge, do the uh, federal programs and other grants that are used to pay these employees come from mandatory hiring programs? Or do federal education grants or housing grants require the district to hire a certain number of employees with the money? I do not believe they require that, no. But, but there are programs where, for example, Chapter 1 programs in the schools, those are many times positions that are funded out of Chapter 1 federal money. Well, then it would, would it be correct to say that every employee paid with grant funds means that less money is, actually goes to the people that is intended to serve by the programs and is eaten up by the so-called uh, overhead, as I would call it? I wouldn't agree with, with, totally with that, no. I, I think there are valuable programs that are being funded by federal grants in the district, and it's, it's a very important component of, for example, the schools programs that, that not only the district gets, but every school system in the country gets. So it, it, that, 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 that's not unique for them to have, say, Chapter 1 programs in the schools. Okay, thank you. Okay, <clears throat> yield back. Yield back. All right, I'd just like to ask a couple questions in the second round, if I, if I could. First of all, to go back to the pension obligations, is the, the city still paying two colas a year, or have they moved that to one cola a year for its pensioners? Anyone know the answer to that? 
We'll have to get that information. You, will you get that to us? And, and I'll, ask, I'll ask the uh, mayor and council the same. Mr. Hill, I want to explore the $722 million uh, that the city has uh, uh, claimed to be their FY 1995 deficit. Are you familiar with those numbers? Uh, yes. Uh, could you give us a breakdown of how the city comes up with these figures? Um, part of the, the first part of the seven, that I should point out on the 722 million, if you take a look at, um, we have a chart that would show you the composition within our testimony. Tell, tell me which chart and we'll... It would be on page 13. Okay. It's table four. Okay. Um, you have to understand that the way that the district comes up with the 722 million First is to project what their spending levels um, currently are. And that um, the spending um, projections that we saw had a total projected expenditure of uh, $3,885,000,000. And then you would subtract from that the um, budget approved by the Congress, and that gives uh, $631 million. And then the district would add to that um, or had added to that $91 million in additional cash that was going to be needed um, in order for them to fund um, uh, one of their uh, reserves. So you take the 631 and the 91 uh, million, they, they, they've added those together basically. Right, and that basically gives you 722. Yeah. Um, so that obviously any problems that exist in the spending plans would affect the size of that number. Um, any savings that the district expects to have on its own um, would affect the size of that number as well. I guess, Mr. Hill, my question then is, the, when you take a look at then those component parts of the 722 million, how much is, is the, is, of that is actual cash oh. uh, that the district would have to pay out in FY 1995? For example, we okay. talked about some of the Medicaid numbers and the $85 million from the hospital. Is that included in there? Yeah. If we, if we would go to the, um, uh, on page 14, and part of the spending plan that comes up with the um, uh, $3.8 billion includes $550 million expected for Medicaid. And if we just take a look at that alone, um, we can see that um, $82 million plus the 30 uh, million in cost savings and the 40 million, so at least 152 million of that um, would not be cash that was needed in uh, 1995. Um, there are some other amounts um, also that are in there that we're, we're currently looking at and going through the spending plans. Okay. Could you tell us on a cash or accrual basis the position of the city, if you could just kind of retell us what you believe the actual deficit is uh, uh, today as we look at it, uh, current deficit and then project it into, into 95? Mm -hmm. um, real, real numbers. In terms of the potential cash balance problem, and, and the reason I have to say potential problem is because there are a number of, of um, initiatives that are out there that we don't know whether they're going to be successful or not. Um, if you go to page 16 of the testimony, um, on a cash basis, um, the potential problem would be uh, $464 um, million, uh, de a deficit uh, on a cash basis at the end of fiscal year 1995. Um, on an accrual basis, that number would be somewhat higher uh, because of expenditures that would be recorded in the year that wouldn't result in cash in that year. Let me turn for a minute to the subject of the downtown arena uh, and uh, the projected convention center, which, as I understand, I think you're familiar with it, it would be an added tax to pay for that. And given the current status of the city's uh, uh, bond ratings, is there any way to finance that uh, at this point without some kind of intervening uh, uh, help from the Congress? 
Um, well, it, it's really hard. It's really hard to say. Um, certainly, the district's bond rating will be a major factor in any financial package that might be put together on the arena. However, um, I think that they will also look to how solid um, the projections are of revenues uh, for that arena and whether or not there are pieces of it that can be um, self-financed. So, so it's really hard to say right now. So that yes, revenue stream standing alone may be able to carry the day? We don't, we don't, we don't know because the, the reason why is that many of those projects are so early on that right. they don't have the total cost um, associated with actually building those, those projects as a result of not having done some of the major studies, right. uh, engineering and architectural studies that would have to... I, I guess, though, conceivably, uh, what you're saying is, is conceivably because of additional revenues that could be generated uh, and if it, if it equaled the carrying costs for the cost of, uh, of the uh, convention center, conceivably then financing would be available outside of uh, the, the federal government. That, that's certainly a, a possibility. Okay. All right, I, uh, you, you're back, and uh, Mr. Dixon, do you have additional questions? Just, just one. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Hill, in, in your January, or June of 94 report, um, you pointed out, I believe, and I, I've been searching for the exact figures, but I think you pointed out that uh, Medicaid was running at a rate of $51 million dollars per month, but the district, in fact, was budgeting at somewhere, as I recall, around $40 million. And then I asked you to track that for two months, and it came out $52 million in each of those months. And you, I believe, in a private conversation with me indicated that since it was not a real figure, that in fact uh, Medicaid would be responsible for a substantial deficit unless other cuts were made. Is that, is that correct? Um, th that, that was correct. One of the things that we have to consider, though, in terms of the district's um, projected uh, Medicaid number, um, they project uh, $550 million and then they subtract off the budget number from last year, um, or from the 95 budget. That 95 budget number is clearly understated um, and therefore, that $267 million, which is the result of the two, includes amounts that are really under budgeting of current right. expenditures. Well, when, when the mayor and, and, and uh, Ms. Connell appeared before the committee, I pointed out yes. to her that the 95 number was lower than the 94 number. And since they were running in the current year $10 million over their projection, how she could come up with that. We've been looking for her testimony there. I think basically she said that there was no point in suppressing the number, that she wouldn't do that because it was an entitlement program and it spoke for itself in essence. Um, I think that she also said that there were some management initiatives and some savings as a result of reducing some of the options in, in the plan that they expected to implement. So from your perspective, when uh, uh, the new administration said that uh, a lot of the deficit was due to Medicaid, that, that came as no surprise? It, um, it, it came as no surprise that a portion of the amount um, was a function of the Medicaid. That, that, that's true. Um, it does come as a surprise if we characterize the entire $267 million as an amount that's due to past Medicaid problems. Well, I think you go on, you went in, in testimony in explaining uh, a, a new accounting procedure, at least as it relates right. to the 82. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. Ms. Norton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, to follow up on the Chairman's questions on um, the arena and the <laughs> convention center, um, this is, is money that apparently the district is continuing to collect as we speak. Um, is this money being segregated and escrowed for the purposes intended? Yes, the money is, is in an escrow and is not usable for other purposes. So this money has not been, been used for any other purpose. That's correct. Uh, and if the Congress uh, 
acts, then the preliminary work that Mr. Hill just spoke of uh, could proceed because the money would be there to initiate that work. Yes, the funds are available. Um, Mr. Hill, when did you begin work on this preliminary, I'm um, on this quarterly report? We received the report on January 17th and began work on it immediately. So you began work on, work on it only after uh, the new administration? That's uh, correct. We, as soon as they had it available, yes. How, how uh, had any work been done on the report um, before the new administration came into office? By GAO? No. No, by, by the, the city. District. Uh, in, in discussions with district officials, uh, what was indicated to us was that there had been minimal amount of work performed in developing that quarterly report up until the new administration had come into office. So in getting, uh, in, in, in getting information to you, they had, they had essentially to start, uh, they had to start from scratch. Well, I I, I don't know if it's accurate to say they had to start from scratch. There was a transition team that was in place. Uh, there was a s significant amount of information that they had access to prior to the time that they uh, took office. So um, someone could have been working on the report at that point in time. Yeah. Let me ask you about the um, required uh, escrow amounts the district must collect. Um, you uh, discuss in your report um, the mandate of our Appropriation Act for the district to escrow 20 percent of the fiscal year 1996 federal payment or 132 million dollars. Uh, are you satisfied that the district uh, is able to do that and is doing it or will do it? Um, I don't know what the district um, will do. I mean, in terms of that, it is, it is a requirement. Clearly, uh, because a large portion and an increasingly large portion of the federal payment is used to pay prior year bills, it will create a tremendous financial stress um, on the district to have to um, escrow that money. With the cash position of the district now, is it conceivable that they could pull out $132 million to set aside in that way? Well, it, it's possible that um, in terms of giving that particular federal payment, um, that amount could be withheld from the district. I mean, it, it, it conceivably... I mean, if it, did not, if it did not escrow it. It, it could be conceivably... Um, put into place, it would certainly have a tremendous impact. Uh, could you explain uh, the requirements of the district to begin setting aside uh, repayment of the $250 million it borrowed uh, at, in, uh, recently? Yes. Uh, more the $250 million borrowing has some specific provisions for uh, repayment, and I believe it's August 1st, we, we can get you the exact dates, they have to start escrowing property tax or any of the tax payments um, that come in to the extent they have not already escrowed money for that $250 million. Uh, let me uh, put the same question to you then. Is it conceivable that the district uh, can simply put aside $250 million beginning in August? to assure repayment? Um, it, can, it can be done, but again, it would have a tremendous impact on the cash flow of the district. I mean, it can be done with the, uh, given the city's uh, present cash uh, position? Um, if the money before, or th that, that relates to that, before it goes to other purposes is put aside, um, yes, that could be done. However, um, the, the cash position of the district is such that it would have a, a tremendous impact. Is there any way that the district could corral spending in areas that have been unbudgeted, perhaps uh, because they are virtually mandated areas, such as uh, corrections, Medicaid expenditures, police overtime? 
Um, we haven't specifically looked at that issue, uh, but, but we'll be glad to if you'd like us. Well, the, the, these are where the real burdens in the budget, of course, are with, with spending that uh, must occur. Yeah. And, and essentially my question, I suppose, for you when you can get back to me is, given spending that must occur of this kind, what steps could the district take to rein in that mandated uh, spending? Yeah, there is, there is a small amount um, in terms of the percentage of the budget that either isn't personnel or uh, related to some type of um, um, entitlement type program. And if you were to concentrate all of the, the cuts in that area, that small piece of the budget, you would not come up with $631 million, clearly. So this, this, this becomes uh, 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 something close to impossible uh, to do without some kind of uh, long-term plan to try to get that mandated spending under control. Then. Well, I, I, I think probably um, one way to look at this is that certainly this is a financial crisis for the district. But I think the solutions are um, beyond financial solutions. I think that there are political solutions that have to they be are what, I'm sorry. political solutions that have to be looked at as what well. What do you mean by that? Um, such as some things that have been put on the table already about the possibility of of uh, restructuring. Um, one thing that we have seen is that through the Rivlin report and a lot of the other reports, that the changes that have to be made. Um, in the future uh, concerning uh, the district's expenditures are such that uh, next year the problem gets worse than it is this year. The year after that it gets even worse and the year after that it gets even worse in terms of the gap between revenues and expenditures as they're projected out. So that any solutions that are put in place now um, certainly have to be solutions that address the current problem but also solutions that will provide changes in, the, in the, um, the, the projections out in the future because the problems get worse in the future. But you don't think that the district could uh, rein in that spending by cuts in its budget alone? Um, we, haven't, we haven't made that assessment at this point. I will tell you that it is a very, very large piece um, of the district's budget, obviously and that um, it would be impossible to do that without um, a large change in the, um, um, in, in the employee cost and, and other cost because there isn't a, a large enough portion of the budget that's outside of those areas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Goodnick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as a new member of this committee, I've had a difficult time sort of getting my arms around uh, uh, what really Washington, D.C. is, because in many respects I understand now that it, uh, it has uh, some elements that many other states have. Uh, it, it delivers uh, services that many counties, uh, for example, in Minnesota do. Uh, and it also has a relationship with the school district. And I'm, I'm trying to sort all of this out. And one of the things that I'm having difficulty, and I, I'd like to focus for a minute or two on the school district. And I, the first question I have is exactly how independent uh, are the Washington, D.C. schools relative to the city? Do they have their own levy, for example? No, they, they, they do not have their own authority to borrow. Is that, I assume that's what you... Uh, no, but they have their own levy for property taxes, or do they no. get their funds, do they have to go to the city council to get their money? That, that's correct. Well, the other question I have, and, and I'm having trouble sorting this out, exactly how much money they really spend per pupil unit, because uh, according to some published reports, it's as much as 9540 uh, $9,549 per pupil unit, and I think according to your report from last summer, uh, it's, it's $7,383 per pupil unit. I'm wondering if anybody on the panel can, can sort of rectify those two numbers. Yeah, one of, the, w one of the differences is that when you compare the amount of monies that the district is spending as compared to other jurisdictions, you have to consider the fact that the district, unlike uh, some other jurisdictions would incur most of the curricula development expenditures. Um, and so in making those comparisons, and I'm not sure, it may be the types of activities that they're comparing to comparable jurisdictions. Um, for, for instance, um, in some jurisdictions there are 
the development of curricula as a state function and not a county function. And so they may have pulled out the cost associated with the district's curricula development. That, that's, that's only speculation on my part since I don't know what, what went into the other numbers. Well, the real question I want to get at, and, and, and somehow I want to ultimately sort that out exactly, what the, what the expenditures are per pupil unit compared to a school district, to, for example, in Minnesota or Montana or somewhere else. Sure. But I also want to know that one of the most troubling things in your report is on page 9 relative to the school districts because uh, on one hand the announcement showed uh, 90 staff departures, uh, but the actual FTE uh, data uh, that you report shows an increase of 404 full-time equivalents. Can you put a little more flesh on that? Uh, yeah. Uh, the, the fiscal year for the schools is the same as the fiscal year for the, the district, and it begins on October 1. That is unusual for a school district to have a fiscal year begin on October 1. And typically the district does do some hiring at the beginning of the fiscal year. So that's even th there may be positions that they that weren't filled before that they fill after the beginning of the fiscal year. Now, whether that accounts for why there's 404 more FTEs on board now than there were as of the last pay period in, in fiscal 94, I don't know. But that could be a little bit of it. Um, that's, that's possible. It, it also could be that the numbers that uh, the district is using are actual employees versus um, the FTE change. and. Um, uh, that certainly would be something that we're looking into further because our work is continuing in the area of FTEs. They have to uh, produce a report every quarter that would have that information in that, and so certainly we'll look into it in a lot more depth when we get the second quarter report. Well, the reason I, w I raise this question, Mr. Chairman, uh, you know, is I think we have to find out where the buck stops, and, and apparently the school district is not independent. They have to come to City Council for their funding, uh, so they should be part of the solution as well as part of the problem. Um, and, and I want to I delve into this a little more. I'd like to get some backup on exactly what the uh, per pupil unit expenditures are, uh, what the staffing levels are, and whether or not uh, they're being as cooperative as they should be. We'll do that for Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, any other questions, Mr. Vatoret? Would you like to ask additional questions? Mr. Chrysler? Additional questions? Um, Mr. Chairman, you, we have everybody's been through a second round except for you. If you'd like to ask any additional questions, uh, I uh, uh, apologize for having left. Uh, it's not for lack of interest. I assure you, uh, we have a markup also going on in the Agriculture Subcommittee. So, uh, rather than, than keep this going, we will have an opportunity to talk with you again on Friday, and I'd like to take that opportunity to maybe probe a little bit more deeply. But I very much appreciate your uh, testimony today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hill, Mr. Hill, let me just say on behalf of all of us, uh, we appreciate the work that you and, and your staff have done on this. I think it has shed a lot of light on the district's financial situation. I know the district government appreciates it uh, as well. We're all trying to get to the bottom line so that we can work up from here. We thank you very much. Thanks for your kind comments. Uh, you're dismissed. Thank you. Before we get to the next uh, panel, uh, Mr. Mayor and Mr. Chairman of the Council, I'd like to wait. We may have a journal vote uh, right after the uh, bell rings, and at which point I would recess the committee before you start rather than interrupt you in uh, mid remarks. So let's give a minute for the um, panels to set up. And statement is a short statement we could do. Uh this is just the session convening. Uh, would Mr. Pullman please sit with the panel as well? Mr. Mayor, do you have any objection to Mr. Pullman sitting with you? Because we may want to ask him some questions. Maybe with sitting right here. He's not going to present testimony, but we want to question him, and uh, we want to have have him sworn in too. Bob. 
Yeah, sure, Mike. Okay. I wonder if we would go uh, with the mayor first or the mayor. Yoga straight? Huh? This week? What's the program number? Yeah, can, I, can I drink some water without y'all taking a picture of me drinking water? Huh? Okay, let, me yeah, let me drink some, please. Can I drink some water? Hold up, hold up. Hold up. Now we've had our photo op, so we, it looks like we will not have a, a journal vote, although never know. What I would like to do is ask uh, the mayor and Chairman Clark and Mr. Pullman, if you'd all please stand and raise your right hands. I need to swear you in. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Be seated. Um, let me get some order. Mr. Mayor, before I call on you, I want to get some order in the room, if we could. Can we please have order in the back? Uh, if we could close the doors and please have order. Uh, Mr. Mayor, it's a distinct pleasure to welcome you here before this committee, and you have been kind enough to meet informally uh, with the committee a couple of uh, weeks ago to share some of your uh, thoughts and comments, and we've had a continuing dialogue, and it's in that spirit uh, we my, welcome uh, you here uh, today. And um, your appropriate staff, if you'd like to introduce anybody there with you, we'd be happy to, um, uh, to have you introduce them to the committee, but we welcome you. Thank you for being with us. Mr. Chairman, members of the uh, committee, let me first of all say good morning. And on behalf of the citizens of the District of Columbia, Washington, D.C., and its residents, I want to thank Chairman Jim Waltz and Chairman Tom Davis, the committee members, and other members of Congress for this special opportunity to share information and seek new ways to ensure the financial stability and healthy future of our capital city. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Washington, D.C. does not just belong to those of us who live here. It belongs to all Americans. As partners in responsibility for the District of Columbia, we had a new place in our relationship, a place I believe that is full of opportunity as well as challenge. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to take a considerable amount of time to to talk about our city because I think it's important that uh, we look at the opportunity for new opportunities, recognizing that old views must change and current realities embrace. And I'm confident working with you and with the citizens of Washington and the city council, we will meet this challenge. Also, I'm sure that we all are anxious to move past our present challenge. Uh, our challenge of the budget uh, it's important, but we rather put all of our energy into transforming our education system, making it work for our children, ensuring the public safety of our citizens, building a vibrant business community, and making our government more responsive and more responsible. In other words, we all like to get on with building a city that we all can be proud of. We will meet this challenge, and I'm confident with a lot of work and a lot of uh, uh, sacrifices, this challenge can be conquered. Today is a turning point in the life of our city. We're at a doorway of opportunity. Chairman, members of the committee, my testimony this morning will address five questions providing historic reference as well as the current facts of our situation. Why are district finances so fragile? What is precisely the financial condition of the district government at this moment? What are we in government doing to restore control and rebuild credibility in our fiscal affairs? How can and how must Congress 
participate in this recovery and what needs to be addressed in our partnership with Congress to ensure that a year from now we're not sitting at the same table trying to wrestle with these same kinds of problems for two or three years from now. I know that you are anxious to get on with where we are today. While I appreciate that, we must look at some historical chronology. It was only in 1973 that the citizens of the District of Columbia were given some measure of self-government. I want to congratulate Congressman Diggs and Anchor Nelson and others who worked awfully hard to get us to that point. But they had no model to go on. Washington, D.C. is the only city that is constitutionally uh, constructed that the Congress has a, a bottom line role in our legislation and our budget. And they put together what they thought to be the best deal that they could. But looking some 20 years later, it is clear to me that that uh, charter which was imposed upon us by the Congress was flawed. It was not a perfect union. In fact, it was an uh, imperfect union. First of all, what should have happened? That our books should have been audited prior to 1974 election, January 2nd, 1975, when uh, Walter Washington took office as mayor and many of us uh, as members of the council. In 1975, the then mayor, Walter Washington, attempted such an audit. Arthur Anderson indicated that the books could not be audited in 1975. It was with the help of a financial oversight commission appointed by the Congress that we were able to overcome the financial challenge. The Congress appropriated over $60 million to help us build what was then called the financial management system, which at that time was one of the finest financial management systems uh, in the country. Also in 1974, let me just make this point very, very clearly, that the Congress had managed the district and prior to that time, we were given 44,000 positions. 44,000 positions were the authorized budget strength of the 1994 budget. Also, when we finally were able to audit the books in 1979, my first year as mayor of our great city, we found that there was a $279 million deficit. In other words, $279 million in bills that the federal government should have paid before we took over. And that $279 million is still due us from the federal government because it was that debt that we inherited. The second problem with our charter, and Mr. Dixon spoke a little bit to this earlier, was our pension funds. We have 11,700 firefighters, police officers, judges, and teachers in a pension fund that is a pay-as-you-go system. All of you know that actuarially a pay-as-you-go system is a flawed system. You say, well, how does that affect us now? It affects us very specifically because this very year, the D.C. government, the taxpayers of the District of Columbia, are paying $295 million of hard-earned taxpayers' money into a pension system that only pays those retirees. It does not get at the unfunded liability. And if we had the $295 million that the district is paying for these retirees, 99% of whom retired under the federal congressionally mandated system, that $295 million could be used to either reduce the property taxes on our commercial property, reduce our income taxes, or reduce spending in other areas, and thereby not being able to have uh, that, that burden around our backs. That's $295 million. You say, well, how does that relate? Since 1980, the D.C. government has paid over $2 billion, $2 billion of our hard-earned taxpayers' money into our pay-as-you-go system. 
So at the end of my testimony, one of the things I'm going to ask that the federal government do was, to, was beginning October 1st in 96 to begin to pick up uh, its share of this pension bill, which it means that we are not uh, required to pay the $341 million in 96 that's required. That gives the D.C. government some latitude and some cash availability because our revenues will remain the same uh, as though we were going to pay that out. The third situation, which we all uh, talk a lot about, is that the district was given state functions without conferring state authorities. Let me uh, pass out to you uh, a list of what we call state functions. And I'm not going to read them all, but I'll read a few of them. Medicaid, St. Elizabeth Psychiatric Institution, AFDC, Emergency Assistance, General Public Assistance, Supplemental Income, Energy Assistance, Daycare, Foster Care, Service to the Aging, University of the District of Columbia, State Educational Services, Teachers' Pensions, Arts and Humanities, uh, Prisons, a State Prison. No other city in America operates a State Prison with 9,000. Uh, centers, prisons, parole system, pretrial services, public defender system, D.C. court systems, uh, unemployment compensation. This list goes on and on. I haven't added it up, but I suspect uh, somebody added something while I'm talking about this, Bob. It's about 50 uh, odd functions here that are truly state functions without uh, state authority. And I don't, uh, in order to bring this home a little bit, let me suggest, uh, and Congressman Walsh was was president of the city council in Syracuse, and, and what they tell me was an outstanding president of the council while you were there. Let me just use Syracuse's budget. It's typical of Trenton, it's typical of New Orleans, it's typical of, uh, of Chicago, it's typical of most cities. And we, when you add up the functions of the Syracuse uh, district, they have police, fire, public works, parks and recreations, law, finance, community services, engineering, community development, development, executive elections, and employee benefits, police and fire, and capital appropriations. Uh, and school districts, I think the budget comes to about $376 million. But when you look at the county functions, which are also uh, a part of uh, what happens in, in, uh, in Syracuse, uh, you find that uh, I hope I pronounced this right, uh, Ms. Wallace, Onondaga County. Huh? That's an Indian name. Onondaga. Onondaga. <laughs> uh, you find that the, uh, the uh, county is picking up uh, aging and youth, mental health, health department, department of corrections, district attorney, sheriff, parks and recreation, transportation, probation, library, long-term care, community care, uh, et cetera. But when we look at the, uh, the source of funding for the uh, city of Syracuse, the state provides about 40% of it, uh, and the property taxes uh, Is that for the chart? About 53 uh, percent. The rest of it is uh, federal grants. The only point I'm making is that to drive this home, we have over how many functions? 54 functions that we outline that are state functions that no other city in America has to deal with not to mention the county functions. You say, well, how does this affect uh, our situation here? It affects our situation here is that we look at uh, our employees, the great majority of the employees, with the exception of the school district, are performing state functions. And if we didn't have those state functions to perform, we wouldn't need all of those employees or spend all that money. The other issue, uh, which I'm sure that Mr. Davis can appreciate, that the district is the only state in America with state functions that was not able to tax income at its source. If we were able to tax income at its source, uh, let me illustrate what we mean by that. 
1996, Maryland residents will earn $12.6 billion in the district, while Virginia residents will earn $9 billion. D.C. residents are forced, uh, will earn $3.1 billion by working either Maryland or Virginia. In other words, $18.5 billion will be earned in the district, yet 70% of that income will not be taxable by the D.C. government. If the D.C. government were to tax this non-resident income at 2%, we would get in $370 million. Or if we do it at 4%, we would get in over $720 million. Again, $720 million would go a long ways in helping us to balance our budget. The other area, and I'm going to move on rather rapidly, is the property. The D.C. government can only tax about 43 percent of all the land in Washington, 43 percent. The federal government owns over 50 percent of that land. Uh, I estimate that the uh, property uh, is worth, in our, in our finance revenue office estimates, over a billion dollars, which means that the federal payment is only about 60 percent of what it ought to be in terms of the land that we're paying uh, the federal payment in lieu of taxes. The other area, Mr. Chairman, I want to introduce to the, for the record is the McKenzie Report. Here's an outstanding financial uh, consultant group did a report for the city. It came to the conclusion that if the district government did everything everybody asked us to do, be draconian in our cuts, if we cut to the bone, the district government could only solve one-third of this problem. This report says that the district government could only solve one-third of its problem, which means that two-thirds of this problem has to be solved by the federal government. This is an independent accounting firm, independent consultants. I'd like to introduce to the record uh, the McKenzie Report, which says if we did all you all asked us to do or we wanted to do ourselves, uh, this would not solve the problem. I think uh, Congressman, uh, uh, one of the Congress people asked a question about whether or not we could solve all our problems. I know Mrs. Ms. Norton has asked that question repeatedly. And so for the record, we're going to indicate that we cannot solve this problem by ourselves because of the structural inequities. Now, recapping the uh, first question, we've talked about uh, what the uh, problems are and uh, how we got there. Let me also say that listening to the GAO report, this, this report, uh, when you read it and look at it, it covers, 99% of this report covers the years 91, 92, 93, and 94. I was not mayor during those years. I've only been in office one month and 21 days. And I think when you look at the report, you'll see a number of the spending habits and spending patterns started in 1992. And, but on the other hand, we are forced to have to deal with them in 1995. I think it's important. And so the 1994 audit showing a deficit of $335 million was a report I gave on February 1st, but it was not during the years that the Barrett administration was in office. You say, why do you say that? We have a strong mayor form of government where the mayor keeps all the spending uh, books, keeps all the checkbooks, keep all of the uh, contract uh, authority. And those of us on the council only get reports when we can find out uh, what happens uh, from the executive. Now, Mrs. Smith and I were trying last fall to find out the extent of this 94 deficit. We were told all along that this deficit probably was no more than $140 million. If you look at even the November 2nd uh, letter, which I'd like to introduce from uh, Mayor Kelly to the council, it indicated that uh, November 2nd, 1994, uh, indicates that uh, the basic problem is $140 million. We all thought the problem was $140 million. The council thought so. I was a member of the council. I thought so. And so on November the 9th, when Mrs. Smith and members of my transition team sat down with members of Mayor Kelly's team and Mayor Kelly, and we were told we had a $291 million potential overspending problem in 1995, we were shocked because we had never heard that number before. 
we thought we were dealing with $140 million that Congress had asked us to, uh, to cut. That's manageable. And so we came to the conclusion we had a $431 million problem uh, if we kept spending so on October 1st of 1995. And then on January 2nd, uh, when the Barrett administration took over, and I asked Bob Pullman who, to be my interim financial, chief financial officer, we uh, found ourselves in a mess. Uh, where's my, the GAO? For instance, the GAO had asked for 55 reports from October 1st to December 31st. Only nine reports had been completed during that time. 46 reports were outstanding. The GAO asked us, the General Account Office asked us from January 3rd to February 17 for 93 reports. 139. We're happy to report to you that as of February 17th, all due dates were met except three items for which we were informed of on February 16th. And so we found ourselves in a situation where nothing had been done on this report, which was due you all January 17th until January 2nd, when Bob Pullman, in my instruction, was asked to get this information and bring it forth and give it to the Congress on January 17th. We also started digging into the Medicaid reports and found another mess of, of situation in the sense that audits had not been done in 91, 92, 93, and 94. That the hospital association had uh, sued the city for payments owed for 92 and 93. And so our Medicaid problem came to be a $261 million problem of past due bills on an accrual basis. Uh, Mr. Uh, Nunn from Cooperson Library and gave us a report on that in our audit. I have a copy which I'd like to, uh, to share with you that we were behind $269 million in the Medicaid budget, $261 million in the Medicaid budget. Then this whole question of whether or not we've met the uh, congressional mandate. It's my interpretation that what the Congress wanted us to do was start at the, at the city's requested appropriation of three billion the Congress was uh, working on a figure of three billion three hundred ninety four million dollar request from the city if we reduce that by 140 the Congress came to a point where we had an authorized budget of three billion two hundred and fifty four million dollars three billion two hundred fifty four million dollars but what is clear now members of the committee that the city was spending considerably above that in 94. In fact, in 1994, the city overspent its operating budget on the overspending side by $154 million. $154 million of money was being spent in 94 by the previous administration. We thought the budget had been cut to the three billion, $394 million figure. Moreover, I was a member of the city council, and Mr. Clark's leadership and others, others of us reduced the 94 budget by $130 million. Only the mayor can really cut the budget. The council can urge it, can, can put it into law, the Congress can put it into law, but only the mayor can actually say, stop spending this money. When we found out in 1994 that the budget was not reduced. I'll give you an example. The Alcohol and Drug Abuse Administration was a $30 million 
budget cut twenty seven million dollars. Not one but not one cent had been cut in ninety four. And so one of the things we're gonna ask the Congress to do is to increase our budget authority to be in line with the reality of spending in nineteen ninety four that's carried on in nineteen ninety five. The other thing we found when we came in office of January second was that over seventy million dollars of bills that were due in nineteen ninety four had not been paid. Mr. Hawkins just informed me a few minutes ago that uh, he went into uh, their file and I, looking at the bills when he got there on the 2nd of January and found five million dollars of bills had not been paid in the last nine months prior to October 1st. That's why these vendors are screaming. I've ordered them all put into the system now and, and paid another $20 million of unpaid bills. So we had $70 million of unpaid bills. Pension pay rates carried over to 189 and to 95. Shouldn't have been. Should have been paid in 94. $63 million in escrow carried over. And so we found that we were facing a cash crunch because of the carryover. A little bit later on, I'll share with you uh, our actual cash flow uh, for 95, which I'd like to do. Let's come in and have this. Uh, what it shows is the actual spending for October, November, December, and January. I'd like for the committee to, uh, to look at this. And i just give you the, uh, the bottom line numbers. In October, we had total receipts of $935.6 million. In, in November, in, no, in October, $935.6 million. And we dispersed $743 million, leaving a cash balance of $235 million. And, uh, and to give an example of how, how serious the problem was, members of the committee, that was left over from uh, the previous administration, we dispersed $192 million in October. Many of these were these overdue bills we're talking about compared to disbursement of $62 million in November and $38 million in December and $88 million in January. That's more normal in terms of our cash flow, but we had to put in almost $100 million of expenditures in October for carryover bills. Also, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Committee, let me just indicate to you that uh, the District of Columbia government knows how much money we have in the bank on a daily basis. Uh, I get a report every morning which uh, tells me exactly uh, our investment balance, our book balance, uh, number of outstanding checks, number of checks cleared the day before, and how much we collected the day before. So we know on a daily basis what our cash position is. What GAO, the General Accounting Officer, was speaking of is that we do not know the total amount of cash, I mean, of accounts payables. We'll talk about it a little bit later. And so now we're at a point uh, what are we doing to solve this problem? In conjunction with the D.C. Council, we're moving dramatically to reduce our workforce and cut our spending. Since we're talking about the workforce, we have met the congressionally mandated reductions to go no higher than 32,500 and 88. We're required to get down by the end of FY95 to 33,588 FTEs. We have more than met that as of last week. And this is a number that the General Accounting Office agreed to. We were down to 32,530 full time equivalencies, which is 1,000 lower than required. Moreover, we have uh, plans to further reduce the FTEs by a 750 person reduction in force. We have laws which says you have to give 30 days notice before you can uh, terminate anyone. We also have to make sure our roles are correct because uh, too often we do it hastily and people go to court and sue us and come back on the payroll. 
We have now done that, and we started March 1st. It will be our first round of letters that will go out to these employees. But since we're talking about the number of employees, let me uh, call, call to the committee's attention. Where are all these employees that people keep talking about? Where do they work? If you take the 32,530 FTEs, you will find that 36.8 of all of our employees are in public safety. 36.8% is in public safety and 37.9% is in education. Of the 32,530 FTEs, over 11,000 is in our Ms. education Mayor, system. Me, these are from the appropriated funds. Appropriated, yes. Not non-appropriated. Non-appropriated. Okay. And since we're talking about that, let me say that the District of Columbia government, like any other city, county, state, is entitled to certain federal funds. Uh, we're entitled to AFDC, Medicaid, to Ryan White, AIDS, HIV, all the other funds. And I maintain that that's what we ought to be getting. And our problem in the appropriation is not caused by the number of federal grants we get. So to cut employees off of the federal grants is not solving our problem. In fact, it's discriminatory and it's unfair to suggest that we not get these funds at any other state, county, and city gets. Because we spend $1.6 billion in federal income taxes. And so I'd like for the committee to look at where these employees are so you'll see that we, we, we started with 44,000 in 1974, and we have an additional 10, 12,000 that's on the federal funded positions. I can tell you how many people we have on the payroll as of last week, how many FTEs, how much money we have in the bank. So I'm not going to go through all the pain we're suffering here at D.C. General Hospital where we are firing the 240 workers. Let me say something about just firing people. There are those who say, you all just arbitrarily fire people tomorrow morning. Uh, my view is that these are human beings too and that we ought to be very careful about doing it that way. They have mortgages to pay and people to take care of, but we need to do it is orderly. That's why it's taken me from January 2nd to March 1st to put this together so we do it the right way so that we can then do it in a way where at least people can somewhat, if you can ever prepare to be fired, to maybe get additional monies. We're doing all kinds of things in terms of limiting the emergency system. You have this in your testimony. We're closing one of our two drug and alcohol centers. Uh, we've closed five public health clinics. Uh, I estimate at this point, Mr. Chairman, of the committee, with our program actions, with our personnel actions, uh, we have, from a bottom line point of view, reduced this $224 million part of the problem, which I think we can do, by $70 million. We sent over to the council yesterday legislation. We've been working with our unions on this to get an additional $70 million out of our employee uh, wages. So if you add the $70 million, which we want to start October, I mean, April 1st of this year for six months, uh, we've more than met the $140 million situation. Then you add uh, our specific spending plans. When we came in in January 2nd, uh, there were no spending plans. There were no ideas of how we were going to do this. We are confident that the executive branch of this government, unless the court stops us or the council doesn't cooperate with us, we can reduce this budget in 1995 by $224 million. That's an incredible amount to do in about seven, eight months. I don't think any other city, a county, or state could come to the table and do that in seven or eight months, reducing the budget by $224 million of service cuts. Our other proposal is to restructure our debt to give us an additional $70 million. We have $224 million, $70 million from our employees uh, contributing their fair share, $70 million of restructured debt. That then leaves us with a problem of $267 million. 
That's the area we ask in the Congress to look at. We ought to begin in 1995, the transformation of our government, where the federal government takes over the complete management and funding of Medicaid by 1998. $267 million in 1995, $141 million plus of growth uh, of that for 96, $141 million plus of growth in 97. So by 1998, we're proposing that the district government no longer funds or manages our Medicaid program. We need to focus on the state functions being transferred to the federal government. Secondly, we're proposing that we begin a five-year phase-out of the state's responsibility for the funding and control of our state prisoners. We want the federal government, starting October 1st, 1995, to begin to manage and fund a portion of our 9,000 state prisoners. Thirdly, we like for the federal government to look at our debt, we have over $3.2 billion of capital debt. In 1983, we were able to get an A rating for our debt. The reason we could not get a higher rating was the unfunded pension liabilities. By that time, almost $3 billion. The uncertainty of the federal payment, the narrow economic base of the district, and our inability to tax income at its source. Uh, our view is that there's a portion of $3.2 billion capital debt. It were, were backed by the full credit and faith of the, of the federal government would get us a low interest rate. I'm in the process now of getting numbers of what it would look like uh, if we were to take that portion of the debt uh, whose interest rates are above the going interest rates refinance that with the full faith and credit of the, of the federal government. Again, that would save us money in 1995 and to the year 2013. I indicated earlier we asked in the Congress for budget authority of $3,521,000,000. That's the three billion two hundred fifty four million add on to it two hundred sixty seven million dollars to give us that uh, budget authority okay. finally as I conclude in this direction uh, let me say that I'm committed and we have at this table in this administration some of the best talent in America in public service committed to doing our share in this equation. We're prepared to, to make the tough decisions to reduce this budget, as I said earlier, by $224 million in service cuts. Our employees are, are being asked to do $70 million, and the Congress is being asked to do $267 million. And we'll talk about the Medicaid budget in a few minutes. Uh, I'd like to ask Mr. Pullman to talk about that, and then I'll uh, after I conclude this, but the view has been that home rule for the district established a clean financial slate for D.C. residents. The reality is that when audits were finally possible in 1979, it was found that more than $279 million in unpaid bills were carried over from the federal government. In addition, as I documented earlier in this testimony, unfunded pension responsibilities for federal employees were transferred and hold to future district taxpayers. As I said earlier, it's time for the federal government starting October 1st to begin to address its share of this $295 million pay-as-you-go system. The view is that D.C. has a large and prosperous tax base is not true. As we've seen, we only can tax 43% of the property. Uh, we can still negotiate shared responsibilities. We also have to work at how we become more efficient in our own operation. We also have to move towards transferring a significant number of state functions to the federal government with the D.C. government doing the rest. 
The view also is that we're not responsible managers. Let me just say that we have a financial management system that's antiquated. It was a state of the art in 1980, 81, but I'm here to tell you that we need reinvestments in it. We need technology improvements in it. We need to look around and find who has a state of the art financial management system that can give us on time, online information. And we recognize that. Uh, yeah. Someone told me the other day, last night, my staff, one staff member said, if the script is badly written, you can have the best managers in the world. We guarantee you the play is going to turn out bad. The same is true with our financial management system. It is not adequate to meet our needs in 1995, 1996. On the other hand, it does give us some basic information about our obligations and our spending. We need to invest in infrastructure of that. <laughs> also, uh, there's been some discussion about the relationship between our citizens. We are, we are forging a new relationship with our citizens <coughs> in the sense that a number of people are, are coming forth to volunteer, to help out. In fact, my wife heads a, a group called the WISH Foundation, uh, which is forging a new partnership between citizens and <coughs> the Recreation Department. And they have donated over $200,000 of, of money and time and other things into uh, what we are doing. And we encourage our citizens to step forward. But with all of that, with the citizens stepping forward, with the D.C. government doing its share, uh, we still need two-thirds of this problem to be solved by structural reform, by transferring function from the D.C. government to the federal government, and also by uh, becoming a more efficient government. And uh, in closing, on my part of this, before I ask Mr. Pope, just talk a little bit about Medicaid. Uh, we come together today seeing Washington, D.C. as both a national problem and a national treasury. Our city has some of our nation's cruelest challenges, homeless mothers with babies, drug trafficking, illiteracy, and teenage hopelessness. We also carry our nation's greatest hopes, personal prosperity, freedom of spirit, and a right to self-determination. Members of the committee, we have a theme in our government. The theme is simply that everyone matters. This theme does more than articulate our caring for each person. As important as that may be, it states the belief that everyone has value. Everyone has something to give. Everyone is responsible. Everyone contributes to the whole. I have a vision for Washington. I see a city where children are born healthy and grow up healthy in safe conditions. I see a city where young people go to college and older people also continue to learn. I see a city of thriving in industrials of tomorrows, including health care, music, tourism, and publishing, as well as government. I see a city where service in the public and private sector is considered honorable. And I see a city where faith abounds and where faith is rewarded. I think that gives you a little bit about my philosophy. And we talked about that yesterday with the speaker about getting beyond that. And finally, let me take about four or five minutes to ask Bob Pullman to talk about the Medicaid, and then we're ready for questions. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I just wonder if I could go to move to uh, Chairman Clark first and then to Mr. Pullman. Oh, I'm sorry. Would that be all right? Would that be all right with you? Uh, the, the Chairman has a brief statement, and, and we'll go to Mr. Pullman, <laughs> then we'll answer for questions. We'll get them all in. Mr. Davis, you say so, you know. <laughs> just want to do follow protocol. Uh, Mr. Pullman just part of my testimony, Mr. Clark. I wouldn't That's try right. to take yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I I Dave, appreciate well, welcome, welcome, chair Lula, people to recognizing. You oh, need to turn your microphone on. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and also Chairman Walsh and members of the uh, committee. I do appreciate the opportunity to testify before you at this joint hearing today. Uh, I'm not joined at the table by any of my colleagues, but last I looked around, I, I've seen five of my colleagues, Council Member Frank Smith, Council Member uh, Kathleen Patterson, Council Member Hilda Mason, Council Member Charlene Drew Jarvis and Council Member Harry Thomas uh, in the audience. And I am joined by the Budget Director for any kinds of technical questions that we might have. Uh, the district's fiscal crisis presents tremendous opportunity for change, growth, and development of our nation's capital. 
The Council recognizes the full dimension of the crisis we now have. We have an immediate problem. We have a long-term challenge, and we are facing it. Just yesterday, the Council took action to reduce the base wage uh, rate for all district employees. We expect that this will result in a $70 million savings for this fiscal year. It also began a process for an elimination of 1,200 positions beyond the 2,705 positions the Council cut in the fiscal year 1995 supplemental. The Council had cut the personnel line by $30 million in anticipation that the Mayor would renegotiate the contracts with collective bargaining units. The negotiations were proceeding, but with no concrete results. I must tell you that as a friend of labor, our decision to roll back employee wages was one of the most difficult decisions I have ever had to make. Among the other things the Council has taken to address, actions it's taken to address the immediate fiscal problem are to provide for early, uh, easy out and early out retirement programs and a voluntary severance program for fiscal year 1995. Uh, the early out and the easy out have been extended and as of emergency leg legislation yesterday, if the mayor signs it, the voluntary severance is to be extended as well. We adopted the fiscal year 1995 supplemental budget, which uh, <coughs> cut and reallocated 278.9 million dollars uh, in appropriations and 2,705 positions cut. We went into very difficult areas, areas of entitlement, uh, aid to families of dependent children, some extent into Medicaid. We took away the supplement that the District of Columbia was given to giving to recipients of Social Secu uh, Special Security Income, SSI. We eliminate eliminated much of our emergency assistance program. We uh, took away the stipends which members of our boards and commissions uh, receive uh, unless they're in a full-time board or commission. We, uh, redu we eliminated the funding for the Commission on Women. We'd already eliminated the funding for the Commission on Men. I guess we've at least got gen uh, uh, consistent with the Equal uh, Rights Act there. But uh, we reduced substantially uh, the Commission on Latino Development uh, we limited funding for the Commission on Arts and Humanities to that which would be necessary to match with federal funds. In this fiscal year supplemental budget, we did something with those funds that we, we had cut. The first thing that we did was we budgeted, a budget item. We budgeted $140 million to not be spent on anything, but to be reserved to meet what we understood to be your requirement in the fiscal year 1995 uh, Budget uh, Act and its report. We also budgeted, and this becomes important, very important in understanding what we did and in reading the GAO report, because I'd like to make this reference particularly uh, here in, in recognition of what the GAO has reported. We budgeted $79 million not to spend for anything but as a cash reserve. If you look on page 11 of the GAO report, it shows that, but it shows it as an expenditure, as an additional cash need. If you read the language of the fiscal year 95 supplemental that we sent up, it is a, a budgeted item to not spend. And if you add that to the 139 there at the bottom of page 11, you come up with 200 and some million dollars. Similarly, if you look on page 12, it says that on February 1, 1995, the mayor announced that overspending in district agencies could result in 3.89 billion uh, in expenditures, or 631 million uh, over the 3.25 billion expenditure. Recognize again that we budgeted $79 million to not spend on anything, subtract it from that 3.89, and we're at 3.1. So I make that point. We took that ta uh, uh, task, which I hope those of you who have come from uh, local and state legislatures might appreciate as a matter of <coughs> discipline. If you simply don't budget the money to spend for something, to set aside in some way, some of my colleagues or somebody in there are all trying very hard now to, to, uh, to uh, somebody might, I might catch hell for that, but uh, some, somebody might just go and spend it. 
So we budgeted that. Now it looks like for that discipline, we might be getting a bad report card here. Uh, um, but $79 million of that money that we budgeted was for that specific purpose. Okay. We also uh, provided for a tax amnesty program for fiscal year 1995, which is expected to generate $12 million. Uh, that added to the $79 million we budgeted not to spend will create a cash reserve of $91 million. We didn't just stop when I hit the gavel with respect to the budget and transmitted it uh, to uh, the president. Uh, we went on watching what was happening. The committees, the councils, committee of the whole, has held an oversight hearing on February 8th in order to receive testimony from the administration on their progress toward meeting the budget cuts and reallocations of the fiscal year 95 supplemental. I'm providing you for, for your record with a copy of the transcript. Of, of, of that hearing. And the reason I'm doing it, I'd like you to look at it. It might be uh, uh, you've got an awful lot of other things to do. But if you would glance through it, you'll see that the kinds of questions that my colleagues and I asked in the course of looking at the implementation of that budget are much like the questions that you've asked here today and that which you've asked uh, the General Accounting Office to look at for you. We are trying to stay on the case. We are trying to watch what will happen. Not only has the Council's Committee in the whole, of the Whole looked at the whole situation, our Council Committees on Human Services and the Judiciary, together responsible for oversight of 55% of the appropriated budget, have held further oversight hearings on these matters. And I have asked all of our committee chairs to regularly review the financial reports of agencies under their oversight. The Council is on the case and wants to stay on that case. I would like to note from what we saw that we were pleased with the administration's report on the employee uh, buyout programs, early out, easy out, and voluntary severance. We were told that 1,920 positions had been vacated with no backfilling. We continue to be concerned with respect to some issues, particularly uh, regarding contracts, and we're going to be watching uh, those very carefully. And as I mentioned in a moment, uh, we may need some of your assistance uh, in that regard. We've examined the mayor's plans for $224 million in reductions, um, and we're pleased that our fiscal year 1995 supplemental laid out much of the foundation for his plans. We look forward to working with him in this regard. As a matter of fact, in 23 of the agency lines, the mayor has the same reductions which we already budgeted for in our fiscal year 95 budget. In 49 of the agency lines, we've made a larger reduction than has he and in 17 of the agency lines, he has proposed a larger reduction than us. So we're working together with our mayor. We've already laid the budget basis for some of what he says he is going to be doing now. Compounding the immediate physical crisis that we face in the District of Columbia are major structural problems. Much reference has been made to the McKinsey report. We would commend that to your attention as well. These include the inability to tax income at its source, an unfunded pension liability inherited from the federal government and the responsibility for carrying out state, county, and municipal uh, functions. And as noted in the Rivlin Commission report in 1990 and the McKinsey report in 1994, the excess tax burden of D.C. residents and businesses is caused to a large extent by the limitations in the Home Rule Charter that prevent us from taxing 60 percent of the income earned in the District of Columbia and 55 percent of our property, much of it that is federal, that is tax exempt. As the mayor and several studies have noted, our assumption of state functions is quite costly. In the District, Com District of Columbia Department of Human Services alone, the costs for Medicaid, AFDC, and foster care are over $414 million. Meanwhile, however, we are building for our future, and here we need your assistance as well. We have begun planning for an expanded convention center, for a new arena to bring professional sports back to our city, and for a municipal parking authority like those of our neighboring Prince George's and Montgomery counties. Congressional legislation is needed to proceed. We have reduced the franchise, gasoline, and sales taxes, thereby reducing some of the tax burden on business to stimulate job creation. As we have plowed through these grounds, we are seeing many areas where Congress can be of help in our journey. For instance, although we are not a state, the constitutional injunction against state laws impairing the obligation of contracts 
may well stop some of the efforts that we are undertaking to review our contracts. That provision does not apply to the Congress. We are prohibited by the Home Rule Act from treating any employee hired before 1980 differently now, 15 years later, than we would have treated him then. That, for instance, if we wanted to furlough on a holiday, we would have to call, we would have to call the personnel records for each employee to see whether that employee came on before 1980 because of this provision, 15-year-old provision. We are not only interested in looking at employment contracts, but at contracts for goods and services. Our Court of Appeals has said that we must be authorized by Congress to review contracts made by the executive as this part of its determination of the separation of powers. We have, in the fiscal year 1995 supplement pending before Congressman Davis's subcommittee, a section which, if uh, enacted by the Congress as part of the Budget Act, would give us the ability to review contracts worth over $1 million uh, and, and, and get some of the information uh, that we haven't always been able to have and would like to see. Indeed, while we respect that the Congress may want to look at our budget requests more carefully under the current conditions, I respectfully, and I do it respectfully, submit that it would help if it did so more quickly. It is very difficult to question uh, administrators regarding spending plans for a budget that has not yet taken effect. Uh, there's been a lot of references here uh, to the pension problem. And there's been a lot of references to Medicaid. There's been a lot of references to what other states do. One thing different about the pension problem, it is clearly a role in which the Congress can help. That's not one that every other state is having the problem with. It's not one that if you came to our assistance, you might have to say, how, explain how you didn't come to some other state's assistance. This is one which by the General Accounting Office's own uh, analyses is based upon what the Congress did or didn't do going back to the beginning of the century. Uh, Congressman Dixon asked whether uh, the, the amount of the uh, district's annual payment to the pension fund might be some source of relief. Uh, and uh, it, it may be that that would be the way that your relief could be uh, helped, given to us, uh, rather than some other hook upon which you might want to ha hang that. But it is clearly one where I think that you uh, uh, maintain some responsibility. Um, we may be coming to you with uh, further information with respect to something that we're going to hold a hearing on in the City Council tomorrow. Nine members have co-sponsored a resolution to ask you, uh, we haven't voted this yet, but to ask you uh, to look at the uh, uh, corporate property tax exemptions of uh, organizations that uh, are federally uh, related uh, in their home jurisdictions, not across the nation. But uh, we have one here, I believe there's one over in Virginia, uh, 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 and there's some other places where uh, they pay no corporate tax uh, uh, funds. And we'll be looking at that and, and sending your advice on that uh, as well. Um, in one, uh, uh, Congressman, you were asking about the schools. Uh, uh, they do come to the city council uh, for their funding, but under a, a provision that the Congress wrote that's in the congressional law, we cannot have any line item review of their expenditures. That has been a matter of intense frustration. We get to do the taxing and they get to do the spending. We have the political dichotomy in this city where I get one job and they get another. And I don't want to tax, they sure want to spend. And so it, it, it builds that tension in there. And sometimes somebody somewhere is going to have to uh, look at that problem. I thank you very much and available for questions. Okay, th thank you, Chairman Clark. Uh, Mr. Pullman, I think we'd like to call you now. You're going to shed some light on the Medicaid situation and take as much time as you need. That, let me just uh, add one point about our uh, money and our accounting. Sure. Someone asked a question about insolvency, and, and we could define it differently. But let me just say to the Congress and to the citizens of Washington, we know how much money we have in the bank and how many bills are outstanding. i just give an example. As of the 21st of February, which is yesterday, we had almost $125 million of available money. We had 300, almost $400 million of funds, but some of them are in escrow and et cetera, as you very well know. We had bills of $42 million, which means that we have enough money in this bank and we'll have it until the middle of May to pay our bills on a, on a, on a regular basis. Okay. We'll get some questions Thank on that, but I appreciate that clarification. Mr. Pullman. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much. My name is Robert Pullman. I'm the Interim Chief Financial Officer for the District of Columbia. I want to make a few comments on the Medicaid program because it's such a major factor both in the audit results for 1994 and in the increase in the uh, district's budget problem in 1995. <coughs> Between 1990 and 1994, there was a 93% growth in expenditures and a 36% growth in a number of recipients who utilized medical services paid for by Medicaid. Uh, hospital expenditures have increased by 50 percent between 1992 and 95. The expenditures for nursing facilities increased by 13 percent between 92 and 94. And expenditures for intermediate care facilities increased by 24 percent between 1992 and 1994. The costs have been rising rapidly in this program due to inflation in the medical services area, due to increased utilization. Uh, more people coming on to the rolls, uh, greater utilization by the facilities involved, the hospitals involved. And so we've been playing catch up, as it were, with the Medicaid program for some time now. Uh, original budgets submitted or developed uh, some 12 months in advance uh, for Medicaid uh, rarely end up being the budgets that have to be uh, used or rarely end up being adequate to cover the actual expenditures that, that result in this Medicaid program. One of the things that we tried to do in January, besides go through the audit reports uh, that were supplied to us by the auditors for nursing homes, intermediate care facilities, and hospitals, one of the things we tried to do first of all, was put out all of the cost, $260 million of accrued costs from settlements uh, or from um, estimated settlements from 91 through 94. And then we turned that into uh, looking at the 95 budget problem, adding that to our 95 budget problem. And we did one other thing, and this is an important change in our approach toward looking at Medicaid. We added in the estimate for 1995 what we called an accrual for $82 million. And when we presented the problem uh, on February 1st, we put an asterisk next to that $82 million <coughs> and said that the cash effect would be uncertain. But what is important is that we really, by doing that, said that we need to put our budget on an accrual basis for Medicaid. That when the auditors get done looking at the Medicaid results each and every year, they book a charge against us based on an accrual, based on an estimate of how much more we might have to pay out uh, for Medicaid costs. And so in doing our 1995 projection, we went to an accrual basis <coughs> budget estimate and added an accrual in the budget itself because if we don't have that kind of budget authority and if we don't provide for that, at the end of the year when we get audits and a large charge is booked against the district, we are going to have operating deficits like we had in 1994. To prevent that, we want to get ahead of the curve, put that estimate out in advance, put it in the budget, not have it as a non-appropriated charge after the end of the year, not find out about it later when the auditors do an audit. So that's a fundamental change in the approach that we have made to trying to get ahead of the rising Medicaid cost curve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we'll start with uh, questions at this point. Let me just start by thanking everybody for coming up here. I know this has been a, a difficult period uh, for the district, but uh, you know we have a constitutional oversight responsibility here, and in these tough times, we want to work with you every way we can uh, to try to help uh, bring the city back. Uh, we're not going to agree on everything, but we're going to sit down and work through these problems together. One of the, uh, let me just address quickly the state functions, county functions issue that the mayor uh, brought up and the pension liability. I think, I, I think you make some good points. I think these are issues that we have said we're going to revisit with you. Uh, this is not any desire on the part of Congress to take over the city, but maybe basically to restructure the relationship in a way that's compatible. Uh, for both of us, and uh, I'll, I'll just say publicly, I think these are on the table, and we're going to look at these issues uh, through time. 
But I don't think the, that's the fundamental problem that brings us here today. The problem that brings us here today is, is it, particularly over the last couple of years, looking at what the district has proposed to Congress and then how they have gone ahead and spent their money. And therein lies the difficulty for many of us on these panels. Um, we talked earlier about the $140 million in cuts that was uh, last year um, uh, the Appropriations Committee and the Congress passed uh, on to the Mayor and the Council. Um, they also, though, I think probably because they were a little suspicious of what the actual numbers were coming from the district, put a cap of $3.25 billion in terms of the city spending. And that's the current law in the land today, that to the extent you exceed that, uh, your uh, future payments uh, may be deducted. And we, at this point, are facing that. And as I understand your proposed solution to that, uh, is you're saying to us is uh, basically don't penalize the city by deducting future payments. And in addition to that, uh, we want you to pick up uh, 267 odd million dollars uh, in the Medicaid uh, uh, payments that the district can't afford to make. Is that fair? Chairman, again, to reiterate, uh, the, the Congress was acting on the basis of what it considered accurate information. Mm -hmm. The Congress is, and the Council is acting the same way, but we now know that that information was not accurate, that the uh, previous administration had been forthcoming with accurate information. Mm -hmm. And so since we now know what the truth is, I think GAO, the General Accounting Office has agreed with us. Uh, they disagree on the accrual and the cash part, but they agree that the Medicaid budget uh, has an accrual of $261 million in it. So it's accurate to say we're asking for budget authority to take us up to $3,521,000,000. And also, I know why the Congress put the uh, penalty in it, because they didn't believe the district was disciplined enough to, to, uh, to cut itself. So therefore, when you do that, you put people in the penalty box. Yeah. But it's a two-edged sword in the sense that we overspend by $40 million. It means our cash is $40 million less. Then we get $40 million of reduced federal payment. We got $80 million penalty as opposed to a 40. So we're asking that the, uh, the uh, limits be looked at and we revisit the penalty part of this. Uh, we are convinced, Mr. Chairman, and the General County Office will be getting these reports, that if we, if we, on the short term, deal with the district government reducing its budget, as I said, we're going to have to do and will do, and the Congress steps to the plate on the authorization of 267. We don't need $267 million of cash right. for 95. We can work out what that means in terms of cash. Then we can begin to look at the structural relationship. So what you're right, you're right. What brought us here is the fact that we were spending in 94 far above what the Congress thought, far above what the council thought, thought was happening. And uh, secondly, the, uh, the, the, uh, the penalty box that we would, we would be in. But we took an opportunity, as you all know, we agreed to talk about the larger issues that we like to work on that are more structural in nature. But the immediacy is is the is, right. is 267. Well, that, that falls under Mr. Walsh's committee's jurisdiction. It was a, right. actually came from them, and, and they're gonna, he's going to have to, I think, explore that a little bit uh, uh, further as we move forward. But, but that is, it was based on numbers given to us by the city. Not you, understand, no. but it, those numbers were based on that, and now uh, it, it puts the Congress in a very difficult light of, of where, where the existing law is right now, where it penalizes the district even further. Mr. Chairman, uh, our approach to that is that we're going to submit a supplemental budget to the City Council on March 8th uh, with these uh, numbers in them. And the United States government uh, has a supplemental as it does in its cycle. Right. Or uh, as in 1991, there can always, always be emergency legislation uh, that would seem to me originate maybe in your committee in terms of authorizing and end up in the appropriation part of it. So I think the Congress and the federal government has the mechanisms to technically and legally solve this problem if it uh, desires to do so. Because okay. the uh, fiscal year doesn't end on September 30th. Okay. That's when the penalty starts. Right. I only get five minutes, so I want to run through oh, a couple questions. Right now, under your current projections, uh, either you or Mr. Pullman can answer, when do you see the district literally running out of cash? If we pay all our bills. Um, our projections are that uh, if we don't get assistance, we're going to have severe cash problems in May. Um, I want to uh, indicate that uh, we 
are paying bills with a 30-day lag time from date of acceptance right now. We would need to continue that kind of policy. Uh, we, we could not simply pay all of our bills off quickly. Uh, but if we maintain the current cash management policies, we believe that we can continue um, having adequate cash until May. Okay. Uh, I have other questions, but I'll get it on the, on the next round. Thank you very much. I'll turn it over to Chairman Walsh. Thank you, Chairman Davis. Uh, I would like to thank the Mayor and the Council Chairman and the members of the District Government for coming today uh, and uh, expressing very forthrightly their concerns. Uh, we, too, are deeply concerned, and I applaud the actions that you all have taken thus far. Uh, I'd like to s hopefully we'll be able to go around again because there's, there's a lot of ground to cover. I'd like to take my first five minutes just to respond or comment on some of the things that the mayor said in his opening statement that I think were important. First, um, the mayor mentioned that in 1975, the, the, uh, when Mayor Washington became mayor, an audit was requested and the books couldn't be audited. I would suggest that based on what the GAO told us today, some things just haven't changed in 20 years. Uh, the books still can't be audited. Uh, the, regarding the pension, the federal government's commitment to the pension was $52 million a year for 25 years. That's $1.3 billion. That's a substantial commitment. And part of the problem, the structural problem that hasn't even been mentioned today is the fact that this is probably the only pension that I know of where two cost of li living allowances a year are provided. That is not affordable. Um, the district fought for home rule and fought the good fight and won and made commitments when they got home rule. And now uh, those commitments quite clearly have not been met. We're told that the Congress has not met our commitments. It's pretty clear that the district has not met theirs. Part of home rule was presenting balanced budgets, and the GAO showed us at least in the last four years balanced budgets have not been presented. The mayor mentioned that 44,000 positions were authorized in that Home Rule bill 20 years ago. Since then, the population of the district has decreased dramatically, as has the tax base. So commensurate reductions in employment are required. Very, uh, I thought, very interesting uh, that the issue of the Syracuse uh, area was, was uh, used. And I, I use that all the time because that's my experience. In, Mayor, I, I congratulate you. Uh, uh, you. You come well prepared. Um, we had your testimony about 10 minutes before the hearing, and you had GAOs two days before. You're, you're, uh, you're very good at this. I'd like to raise my hat to you. Uh, Syracuse, uh, Syracuse's tax base is about 47 percent tax exempt. The district's is uh, it's, it's 43 percent, something like that. Most major American cities have the same problem. Even though they don't, they're not the seat of the federal government, they're the seat of city, county, sometimes state government, with churches and parks and colleges and hospitals and all the things that the district has. So it's not unusual in that sense. Uh, one of the pro another problem that, 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 that was not mentioned, but was mentioned by the mayor's transition team back in November, structural problem the district has, was the, er, is the amount, the extremely high amounts that are paid for public assistance uh, within the district. That's, a, that's, not a, that's not an entitlement. That is a discretionary spending by the district. And the mayor used the other day used the figure of about $30,000 as the average public wage in this city. That's a high amount of money for a public employee. Um, The, the McKenzie report was cited, and it's very clear that there's a tremendous burden upon the district to perform these other functions. But if you buy the McKenzie report, which says that two-thirds of these financial obligations are the districts, or, or should be the federal governments, and only one-third should be the cities, why should there be home rule if two-thirds of the responsibility is ours? I ask that rhetorically. Regarding the previous administration, even though the, the Berry administra administration presented balanced budgets during, most of the time during its administration, 
the cash supply dwindled year after year after year. No money was spent on the schools. The schools are full of fire code and housing code violations that are dangerous to those kids. Even City Hall, a magnificent building we visited the other day, uh, is in such bad shape that the prior mayor moved out. The council, to their credit, are still there. <laughs> As a former city councilor, I empathize. The, the mayor bemoaned the problem of the, the financial management systems. Why weren't they reinvested in, in prior administrations? My mother got have mercy on her soul. When I would complain about how things were, she would say to me, Jim, you made your bed, now you have to lay in it. And that's exactly what's happening. The last year of the Berry administration, there was a $118 million deficit. The last year of the Kelly administration, there was a $400 million deficit. It's pretty obvious that what has happened is both administrations masked the problem, and when there was a change, it became clear. No surprise. Regarding um, the, uh, the, the uh, workforce issue, uh, the GAO says that the cuts have not been made. And I'm hopeful that we can get a list of the individuals who, who have left city employ, <coughs> names, addresses, former positions. So Mr. Pullman has that. Great. And we, we will review that because it will be interesting to see uh, where those cuts were made and, and, and what sort of planning went into those layoffs. Part of the city's commitment to this budget uh, fiscal problem was a requirement that they cut $140 million. GAO says that has not been done. Uh, in fact, about, about $99 million in cuts have been implemented. The transition team, headed by, I believe, Mr. Rogers, suggested in November of 1994 that the district needed to come up with not only $140 million in cuts, an additional, uh, an additional 260 million in cuts. They saw the train wreck coming back in November, yet the cuts haven't been made. We, am I out of time here? All right. Let me just let me just wrap up, and then we'll come back. I'll come back for questions. I I will not bring a, an appropriation bill to the Congress. Uh, I can't do it. It won't pass to give the district more money this year. Even if I wanted to, I couldn't get it done without structural changes. We will not remove that penalty because I think that's what's brought us to the table today, the escrow account and the penalty requirement. And I can't speak for anybody else on the subcommittee, but it would be, it would be next to impossible for us to accomplish that task. I'll leave it at that and uh, give be somebody back. else an opportunity. Back. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Norton. Well, Mr. Chairman, can I comment at some point? Yeah, we'll give you an opportunity. Uh, well, if there's no objection, uh, I have no objection. Mr. Mayor, we'll give you a minute to comment now, not, not take it out of Ms. Norton's time. Mr. Just... Chairman, let me uh, uh, appreciate Mr. Walsh's observations. Uh, let me just take a, a couple of points. Uh, I said to everyone who would listen that in 1990, the last year of my administration, I had lost control of the government because of my personal difficulties. So, that 118 was forecast early in March. Couldn't get the council to act to reduce. But anyway, that was that was then. But the big issue, I think, Mr. Walsh, is these pensions. The two colas and anything else that goes with it were set into law by the Congress. And the Congress has to change that benefit for those who came under that law uh, prior to 1980. Secondly, the 11,700... Mr. Mayor, let me yeah. that. Would you support this? Yes, yeah, absolutely support that. Uh, this pension situation was generous in America. You could uh, be a, a fine firefighter or police officer, which we certainly admire and respect. You come on the force at age 21, retired 41, 20 years, about 6 to 70 percent of your pension for another 25 or 30 years of life. It's very generous. But if you take the 11,700 retirees, 
99% of them came on the force under the federally mandated system. And what's missing here is that the federal government actuarially should pick up all of that. The district should pick up any new people coming on after 1980. And the point we were making here is that even the $52 million just scratches the surface. So if the district didn't have to pay to those retirees, which you shouldn't have to pay for, we would have about $295 million of taxpayers' cash to be used to either cut our, our tax rates or to balance our budget. And I think it's very important that that be looked at. The district government needs relief in the pension areas. It would be more difficult probably because it's such a large amount, but certainly philosophically, the D.C. government should not be paying for those retirees. See, they, they deserve to be paid, but not by, by us. The other uh, part of this is that, excuse me, Mr. Mayor, I, I want to give you time to respond. Let me just, if I could just, on that pension okay. issue, mm -hmm. for the current employees before they become pensioners, you could, for, and for new employees, you could pass a law yes, within your purview to change that, could you yeah, not? Mr. Clark had introduced a law last year. I support it. I hope we can try to work on getting it through the Congress where new employees will have a defined contribution and would be uh, much more manageable than all these other things. But I just want to continue to say that those 11,700 that are now there and retired ought not to be the financial responsibility of the D.C. government. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman Davis and, and Chairman Walsh. Yes, I, I did introduce legislation. Excuse me, just a second. Oh, yes. Information that's disseminated be totally accurate. Uh, Mr. Clark's bill provided uh, for a rollback on condition, a condition preceding that Congress do certain things, extend the pension program for 30 years and increase it at 5% each year after the 25th year, as I recall. I mean, I, I think if we're going to resolve these problems, we have to be totally accurate as to what the facts are. And I'm not criticizing you, Mr. Mayor, but I mean, I've noticed that a lot of conversation here has been very loose in general, Thank which you. are not the facts. Thank you. And so when we say that we have to do something, um, it, it isn't totally accurate, and it's not fair to Congress, and it's not fair to the district to... So I, I would just say, let's slow down here and get the total accurate facts. That's one of the problems around here as it relates to the, the relationship between the federal government and, and, and D.C. Uh, you know, it depends on how deep you have your oar in the water as to how hard you want to pull. And, uh, I mean, I've noticed the conflict this morning, if I may just take a minute, between the things that the council chairman has said and, and the conflict between the executive branch here. I, and I just think enough of this is enough. I mean, this is very serious. I, I'm referring to your opening statements, which uh, said, well, you know, we're doing a good job. Uh, we made the cuts. I, I'm sorry. I don't... I'll amplify on it when it's my, yeah, that's <laughs> my time. Mr. Clark, you wanted just to respond well, to briefly? Uh, on the pension question, I think it's in the line, not, not saying that there was any accuracy, but in the line of, of clarification that I wanted to say. The council did pass legislation. It did address the COLAs, and it did provide that there would be only one COLA. It also provided that our employees would go from 6% contribution to 7% contribution each year, uh, for, excuse me, from 7 to 8 each year. Um, and the cities uh, will have, have to match that, of course. And it was presented and all the time uh, understood there that collaterally the delegate in Congress would be introducing legislation uh, in the Congress. And it was a, it was a program always presented as a, a joint program. And, and uh, um, the, the, the point is that the, the receiving of the money that we get is balanced depending on the program that now is existent that does include the two colas and we had laid out together with the delegate a new program that had an, another approach and it did have associated with it the uh, the repeal of the two colas um, if we were to go with the two colas and, and eliminate them alone which I do believe is in our, our jurisdiction to do uh, that would further aggravate the unfunded uh, li the liability in that pension uh, program. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, yes, Mr. Dixon. It's my understanding that that is not totally accurate either. Uh, if I could just Please. pursue this. Yeah, Mr. Before. Clark, isn't it true 
that the rollback in the COLAs would not take effect until such time as the Congress acted and acted into law a 30-year extension of 5 percent. I mean, so when you say, and it was understood that the delegate was moving legislation, yeah. it was more than any understanding. It wouldn't take effect until such time. Th that's my point, sir. My point is that it wasn't like any kind of, de a de any kind of running from that point, that we've been saying that all along. I, my point to you, sir, is we've been saying that all along, that that would be part of the program. If we were to go and stop the COLAs now ourselves without waiting for the Congressional Act, that would have a more serious aggravating effect upon the pension fund because that's part of how it gets its monies now. Uh, or, 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 or pay, excuse me. No, no, I'm sorry. That's not going to be. That's not going to be the case. No, that's Let me not. Turn that around. Let me the, turn that around. I'm wrong on that one, sir. The, uh, the 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 point. If we if we go start making changes in there now, uh, then it's. It would not in be. other words, if you if you took uh, one uh, one cola away, it, it it would exacerbate the problem rather than help solve it. No, solve I, it. I, I retract that statement. I'd have to look okay. at the math. But, on that. Uh, let, let me just let me just go back and say this part that we have been forthright all the way along that what we were doing was a program to try to at the municipal level and the congressional level deal with this pension problem. So, uh, okay, thank you. I mean, I can't argue with that. Mr. Dixon, I was speaking of uh, the locally uh, introduced legislation to take care of future employees, that which we had authority to do. I wasn't getting into the complexity of these other things. I don't I, think it goes far enough. I understand, enough. Mr. Mayor. I think it doesn't Frank, sound Thank you. You've clarified it. And, uh, uh, you know, clearly this is a subject of interest to, to the committee and I hope to the uh, uh, council in, in the future. And we'll have further discussions and hearings uh, on that issue. Uh, Ms. Norton? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just for the record, the delegate did introduce that bill. Uh, the bill did not move forward, and I am hoping that the delegate will have better luck this year. Uh, it also should be said that the retirees and the employees and the council and Mayor Kelly deserve a lot of credit for having worked with the Congress for over a year in order to get an agreement that would have rolled back uh, colas would have, uh, or at least one cola, and would have increased uh, the contribution of employees. And I do want to say for the record that I asked a search to be done to see whether or not any existing pensioners had ever been asked to do that. And no one could find an instance where uh, people who thought their rights were accrued had been asked to make those kinds of sacrifices. And our retirees and our uh, employees did agree. And out of, out of uh, respect for them, it seems to me we, we really should move forward. I, I do want to clarify uh, something, uh, uh, Council Member Clark, uh, Council Chairman Clark. Um, could the, could the, the district move with a new plan? Now, let me preface this by saying when we had our hearing on my bill last year, not only did all of you testify, but my good friends uh, from the police and the firefighters unions testified, and we had a very interesting conversation. And I said to them, hey, fellas, you got enough of a problem. Now you are, uh, now you seem to be defending against employees you don't even represent, because uh, their initial notion was that there should not be a different plan for new employees who, of course, were not their members. And, and we had an interesting discussion back and forth. Let me ask you this. Could the district, does the district have the authority without additional congressional action to put in place right now a new plan for new employees in those four categories yes, of jobs? The answer is yes. We did have an, uh, legislation introduced last year the legislation was essentially to apply to uh, the new employees in those four categories, teachers, police, fire, and, and judges. The, well, no, we, didn't go, we couldn't go to judges. We were, we, by by your, the Congress's prohibition, we couldn't go to judges. But teachers, fire, and police, the same standards that we apply to our regular workforce. Um, as expected, uh, the testimony came back that you can't really apply the same standards as are applied to a clerk or a secretary or, 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 or a carpenter or, 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 or a city councilman or something. 
uh, that you can to the police and fire because the police and fire uh, tend to retire earlier because of the strenuous activities. You've got to have different standards. So what we put to work, uh, and Mr. Pullman was working for the prior administration, and Mr. Pullman did a very good job of bringing together the experts from all those resources to get to the agreements that we had uh, uh, in what we talked about about the past program. And they've been working to try to work on, on a new program uh, for uh, the future. Most of the testimony seemed to say, that, well, if we just had to do something, just go with the program we have now with a cap on the colas. Uh, you know, the colas could only grow at a certain rate, not, the, not just the number of colas, but a cap on them. That's what most of the testimony said. Um, uh, the council has just uh, uh, retained the services of a new, a new budget person from, uh, who's come to us from Pete Marwick. And uh, as I've indicated, he, he came last week and I indicated one of his first assignments is to meet with GAO uh, to get their views uh, as to the proficiency of, of this kind of idea of a cap on uh, uh, COLAs. Uh, for a new program, but we are intending to move that forward. What, uh, what how soon do you think that could move? Uh, I, I, I hope we can get uh, uh, another round of hearings held, and maybe first reading this spring, because uh, we still have our budget. There was committee. some there was some uh, discussion in our countless meetings that perhaps to move forward after the unions had already taken a hit on on the existing employees, then to pile on top of that new employees was to ask for a lot and we, we put that off and frankly all of us agreed, all right, let's put that off and deal with what's here. But it occurs to me that that's easier, far easier to deal with than what we've done to our own employees and our own retirees uh, uh, because we're talking about people who are not even in existence as far as we're concerned now. We're talking about new employees and it was be the, it's the kind of thing that when I go, if, if, if when, we, when we get to hearings, and we go to the floor, that is what is going to smack us right in the face unless we have that, that to show for it. And I'm sorry that in an area where the, the, I think the, the city has really performed and the Congress has been slow to act, I'm sorry that this issue uh, could indeed stand in the way, but I believe it could. Um, and I encourage you to proceed as you are to try to uh, move forward with that program. Uh, I do want to take note of uh, something that um, Mr. Walsh has said uh, in his testimony uh, because I want to certify what he said and to say how dangerous it is to the city. I have proposed uh, an oversight board whose form could take any who could which could take any form that we, we decided at this time, and I'm pleased that the mayor has indicated some support for the idea. Um, and you know that I had extensive discussions with both of you before coming forward with the idea. But Mr. Walsh just said, as he completed his testimony, that he could not get an appropriation through the House of Representatives. Now, I indicated that the two major reasons that I came forward publicly and urgently with the notion of a control board where, one, we can't borrow, so we won't exist in a few months unless there's some intermediary to help us get to the Treasury. The Treasury will not lend us money without putting the most severe restraints on us. They will be at least as severe as the market and probably more so. With that impossibility. Then there was a second impossibility that you can't do it in the remaining months, not when you compare what the GAO says you have to do. And now there is a third notion on the table. And that one is true death to the district. And that is we don't control these 435 members in their votes. We cannot deliver those members. Uh, and yes, we uh, delivered the appropriation last time in the most amazing way. I've never heard of an appropriation getting through here only with three votes because every member knows that the appropriations have to get through. There are 13 of them, so you just as well fess up and get them through. We now have three reasons that indicate that the district has no choice. I want to say how much I appreciate the discussions I have had with Mayor, Mayor Barry and, and Councilmember Clark and how much I appreciate the accelerated action uh, on, of both branches. 
But I want to reemphasize the danger and to say that I think this simply has to be done immediately uh, to save the city. Thank you. We'll get a second round. Uh, thank you, Ms. Orton. Chairman Walsh. I'd like to recognize our distinguished Chairman. ranking member, Mr. Dixon. Chairman, that take uh, a couple of minutes to come in on Ms. Norton's uh, is there objection? statement. No. No objection. No objection. Go ahead, please. Uh, what we've tried to do, both the council and the, and the mayor, to lay out uh, the problem and some suggested solution. My solution uh, goes uh, not counter to the, to the council, it, it's just in addition to that. But let me just say, Mrs. Norton, that it is clear that we can't solve this problem in one year, even if we wanted to. I don't think anybody in the Congress wants to preside over the demise of the District of Columbia government. I interpreted Mr. Walsh's statement is that without some other kind of things going with it, some structural reform and some other things, that in and of itself he couldn't do that. On the other hand, if we don't get some relief this year from the federal government, we are going to be presiding over the demise of the district government. And I think that's a very clear point from a cash point of view. Uh, that um, the, the, I don't know what you mean by structural changes. It we is my view. It is my view that the kinds of structural changes that need to be made are not going to take place in, in six months left in this fiscal year, and that in, in, in essence the district is up against the wall now, and I, I, I don't think you and I have any basic disagreement, because it needs an intermediary to help it get the time to do what has to be done, and if it doesn't have one, then when it goes to the Treasury, uh, the, the district will have such uh, extraordinary uh, strings tied to it that, in effect, it will have conceded part of Home Rule. I think what's happening is that we talked yesterday about some immediacy uh, of this issue that everything has to be put on the table if we're going to have any kind of board. And secondly, going to the treasury in and of itself is no solution to anything. It's like you owe somebody $40,000 and they lend you that money, you got to pay it right back. We don't, that's not going to solve this problem. I want to get Mr. Dixon a chance to ask some questions. Well, first of all, uh, uh, to my colleagues here, let me express the fact that I am very, very supportive of helping the district in this financial crisis and I personally will do whatever I can to see that um, it is resolved. But I, I do think that we have to be totally candid and I, I think we're only halfway there with our, uh, with our candor. Um, and to your last comment, you know, there's the old joke about if you owe the bank a hundred dollars, uh, the bank owns you. But if you owe them three hundred million dollars you own the bank and to be perfectly candid that's the situation here the district of columbia as we've all espoused uh, the federal government is not going to move and, and and so you have us over a barrel somewhat and there's always been a recognition of that um, it's not really articulated all the time but uh... you're we're all here Nobody's going to let the district go down, and so everybody sits back and says, you got to pony up, and I'm willing to personally do that. Uh, Mr. Mayor, one of the things that, that does concern me, I was not here in 1973, but I imagine that one of the reasons that uh, Congressman Diggs and others uh, st structured the, what I call the Limited Home Rule Act, was to give as much authority as politically practical at the time to the District of Columbia. Uh, when you really look at cities, they don't have a lot of control. It's the state and federal government, particularly in a time of austerity. And so it does scare me a little bit, but it's real when you talk about turning back state, certain state functions, because it doesn't come both ways. Uh, you can't turn back all these functions and really say you have home rule. And I'm sure that when uh, Mr. Diggs and others started articulating this, that in fact um, uh, that was their motivation in having the ability to run their own prisons, in taking care of their, their medical. And so just philosophically, uh, I, I think that we're at a dilemma, and I, I know that there will be discussion uh, here and 
uh, with the authorizing committee on that issue. Now, very, very frankly, when I l look at and hear the testimony of GAO, from my perspective, although there is a lot of talk and a lot of figures on paper, um, really nothing has been done without blaming anybody, this administration or the past administration, to comply with the 1995 budget request. When it's all boiled down, uh, it, it hasn't happened. And I would say to you, Chairman Clark, that even your movement forward with the 99 and the 40 did not comply with what has consistently been a theme up here, and that is cuts. To add additional revenue, which was ultimately re repealed, did not comply with the law. It said that there would be $140 million of cuts. If you listen to Mr. Hill, although it was very low key, he mentioned that. The reports that were the quarterly reports that were sent up here, Mr. Pullman, and we've had a discussion on that. Uh, I disagree with your judgment on it. You said you thought it was better to send up something than miss the deadline. But if you listen to the GAO, it was not digestible. It was like taking a yard of paper and saying, suck on this a while. As it relates to the internal audit, he says that, um, I guess that some edict or order came out that said, in fact, that um, departments or agencies would live within a certain budget. And he says they're not doing that. And by the way, that budget was not based on the 140 cut. It was based on uh, <clears throat> the pre-Congress budget. So all of this uh, goes in my mind, and I would, maybe we'll take a break, as to not how much involvement should be uh, on the part of the district in designing a uh, fiscal intermediary, but how much control should be placed in that fiscal intermediary because there has not, in my opinion, a conglomerate good faith used here. And I'm wondering um, if, if someone can respond to it. And Mr. Mayor, I'll give you a chance on it. <laughs> well, no, I just I wanted to throw out one other thing. We are here talking about the fiscal problems of the district. And I will gladly say that over a period of time, I recognize, along with Ms. Norton and probably Mr. Walsh and, and many other members of Congress on both sides of the aisle, that there are some things that the federal government should do and must do, and, and I'm, I'm pledging to work with that. But clearly, there is no one that can deny, no matter what the skill level of the administrators here, there is a management problem, a management problem in this district with a $3.2 billion um, budget the corrections is under a court order, foster care is under a court order, housing is under a court order, and one would say that the quality of life, life and the cost of living here is in a spin and that there is a management problem. I'm not speaking to the quality of the managers, but there is some problem within the management system. One of which is that the independent agencies, and I suspect that those are not independent, have consistently come before Congress, and when you get to the bottom line, they don't care what the budget says. They think what their program is good, and they're going to run it the way they're going to run it, and at the end of the year, it's not their problem, because they're running that part of the ship and they will go over budget or under budget, whatever it is. And coming here and appearing before the city council is just a formality. Let's get it, that past us, and then I'm going to spend what I'm going to spend. And so I'm sure that, that the message has got to get through to management, Mr. Pullman, 
that this is very serious and it's their problem. And one of the concerns is that when everyone says, well, nobody's going to be cut, then everybody says it's going to be business as usual. Now, I don't say that this is Mayor Barry's fault. Uh, I don't say it's Mayor Kelly's fault. But there is a, clearly a malaise within middle management of this district. It's like calling them in and saying there's only going to be one coffee break a day instead of two. And after you walk out the door, I've been here 30 years, and I'm taking two co co uh, coffee breaks. I don't care what they say. Now, um, I've had my say on this, and uh, Mr. Mayor and Mr. Clark, if you want to respond to some of that. Chairman, uh, can I take a few minutes? Uh, Mr. Dixon, in terms of the home rule discussion, and I, and I thought I made it clear, but I try to make it clear again. And I was here, a lot of us were here during that debate. I said earlier that we were given state responsibility without state authority. It was my view that after the political deal had been made that we couldn't tax income at its source, which was a deal they had to make to get this through, just as we had a two-year period in which we could not enact anything in the district criminal code, I was under the belief, and falsely so, I guess, that over time we would have been able to get the non-resident income tax due. And my plea is very simple. If you want us to keep all these state responsibilities, then give us a state authority. Let us tax income at its source. Let us get the uh, $700 million, which is about a 4%, from those who work here and don't live here. If you don't give us the authority to tax income at its source, mm -hmm. then take some of these responsibilities back. So that's my, my real hard plea. Mm -hmm. Secondly, my understanding, very quickly, we had to go. Mr. Mayor, what, let me, I'd like to, what I'd like to do is cut you off at this point, give you a chance later, and let Mrs. Car, uh, Mrs. Collins has a few questions she wants to put to you, and then we will recess. You won't have time to answer it now and come back at 1.30, if that would be agreeable. That will give everybody a, a break and allow members to go over and vote. Ms. Collins. Thank you very much, Mr. Okay. Chairman. I appreciate this. Mr. Mayor, I have three questions. The one question is, uh, is like this. The district's interim chief financial officer said last Friday that there is now a financial monitoring team of senior officials in place under the direction of the city administrator which will constantly oversee the implementation of new spending reductions and what I'd like you to answer is one exactly how will this team accomplish this task and whether or not the team is going to be a temporary one or a permanent fixture the second question I have is whether you're prepared to develop a multi-year spending plan for the district if there's no additional funds provided by the district of the Congress this year, how long are you, are you think it's going to take before the district can produce a truly balanced budget? And my final question is, do you believe that a change in the method of calculating the federal payments of the district ought to be, is warranted and ought to be increased or decreased? Not, well, I know it's not going to be decreased, but certainly increased. <laughs> I thank the gentleman for allowing me to put my questions on the record. Mr. Mayor, I hope you will answer those questions when we return. Thank right, you. Thank you. If there's no objection, we'll declare a recess and uh, reconvene at 1.30. You're watching a hearing held this past week by two House subcommittees looking into the financial condition of the District of Columbia. We're going to have more of this hearing for you in just a few moments after we take a short break for a look at the C-SPAN 2 schedule. C-SPAN 2 a public service created by America's cable television companies. We're going to pause at this break in the hearing to check our early morning C-SPAN 2 programming schedule for you. We're going to continue with this hearing.